right, guys. Well, here we are. We had our pasture walk. Let's go home. <laughs> now, now, somebody asked me yesterday, he says, is all we going to do is just walk out there for exercise? I said, well, I gave them a long list of what we're going out here for, and I said, plus exercise. So, but anyways, listen, I want to start off by giving you a little history, and I'm going to talk about three different fields, okay? And we'll start with the north field across the road there. We built the fence for that field in 2020. We built this fence here that's a south field. We started the stairs. We had 21 stairs from Holiday Ranch in January of 21. Started on that north field. Seven years prior to 2020, all three of these fields were hayed. And there was never a stitch of fertilizer applied in the seven years. So I want to tell you what we started off with. It wasn't much. Um, <clears throat> just a, a very poor, 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 poor stand of grass, poor soils. And uh, I did take soil tests, and as you would know, we were very, very low in phosphorus and potash. What we did as a demonstration, we put P and K on that north field according to a soil test. Okay? Soil test in this field was the very same, very, very low in P and K. Steers were put on this field September of 21, September of last year. Started on this upper corner right here. And they stayed here, they stayed here until the February the 2nd of this year. Those 21 steers, average weight would have been around 700 to 750 pounds. So 750 times 21, whatever that is, an animal unit. But anyways, they give you an idea. On seven acres. Was it all grass? No. But remember, when we started them here in September, there was two years growth on this field. Stockpile. You can imagine what it looked like. It was pretty hairy. But it's exactly what I wanted. As we started across the field, they got about maybe a third of the ways from the beginning to this trough right here, and then we started unrolling hay. From September to February, I unrolled 115 rows of hay on this seven acres right here. Okay? All on the dry days, except for one day in January, right down here at the end, I have pictures on my phone I can show you. They grazed the last paddock down there. And that night we had three inches of snow. And the next day I unrolled hay on top of the field that they just got through grazing. Okay. We never had any mud. We never had no ruts in the field. Every time I brought hay out here, it was on a dry day. If it rained, they got grass. Okay. Now there were a few days. I probably I'll back up. There were a few days. Say like on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we were going to have ra rain, and I did what they call bale grazing. I wanted to try that. So I would set out three rows of hay in different areas, and we had them fenced to where the animals couldn't get to one row. When they cleaned that roll up, we put the fence around, just moved the fence over to the next row. You can stand up here, and you can pick out every place that I had a roll of hay. You see this tall, and I think it's Sargon Sedan in there right now. That's one. Every place that you see a darker green spot, that's where I had a roll of hay. That's bale grazing. Now, I did a little bit different because I put it out the week that we were using it. Most people, like up in North Dakota, and, and we have one landowner here, they put all their hay out for bale grazing in September. And then they graze it, you know, all winter long. So it works out, works out pretty cool. Um, I didn't know what results I was going to get. I've never done it before. But I'm, I'm tickled. You know, I'm, I'm very happy with it. 
Um, pardon? Absolutely not. Nope. Don't don't want a bale feeder. Don't want a hay up. Don't want none of that part. Did you target? Did you try to target areas that were more? Yes. Good question. Absolutely. He asked, did I target certain areas? Yeah, where we had the the worst weeds, and I mean this field was awful, and but not as bad as that field across the road. June last year, I bush hogged that field wasn't hayed for the previous three years. And do you see the tall trees to the left? That's what that whole field looked like. I had 18 and 20 foot poplar trees in there that I bush hogged, okay? And we've only grazed, let's see, we've grazed that field twice this year. Back in late March, because of the weather, I sowed that field in a five-way blend of cool season grasses. I actually meant to do it in the fall of 21, but I wasn't able to because I had surgery and there wasn't anybody else to operate the tractor, so I did it in March of this year. And then last week, we sowed it again in the same mix. The reason we're doing that, that whole field is nothing but vines on the ground. It's just a lot of junk. And so we're wanting to put some seed on it and I'll take suggestions from anybody on other options, but then I want to cover that whole field again, that field over there this year. That's my plans. Um, let's see, the cows, the steers were taken off of this field, that last paddock as you walked in this field 33 days ago. Okay. Where the heifers and bulls are in that first paddock on the upper side was 55 days ago. Okay. If you look straight across the road, across this road here, the north field, left-hand side of that interior fence, that's 56 days ago. So you can kind of compare the, the regrowth from that last paddock to the first and second paddock of this field. There's a, there's a huge difference in the amount of forage. And, and I don't know why. It's all been treated the same with the exception. We put P and K on there, we put hay on this. And that's the only thing I can tell you it's different. Okay? Uh, we move them every day and they get about um, two to three tenths of an acre. But let's see, well, let's see, 33, 22 days here. Yeah. yeah, 22 days in this field. Right now, in 22 days, they're at the far end of that north field and over two ridges, so you're not going to be able to see them, but you know, if you come out here and drive down the road, you can see them. Yes, sir. Right now, over here, we have 15 steers. With here, we had 20, let's see. Yeah, on the 22 days, we had the 15. Yes. And right now, their average weight is 800 and about 850 pounds. We have, we have two that are over 1,000 pounds. And then we had two that, they just weighed them two weeks ago. Um, 700 and... 750, 800, something like that was a low end. Okay? All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to these four right here, to Jim, yeah, Greg, Russ, Dr. Williams. And what I want you all to do is come a little closer, and I want you to just take and blast them with a lot of questions. They're going to start it off at... Let's, let's ask a lot of questions. And one thing you can't see right here that I'm going to get somebody's opinion is, and I'm surprised you can't see it right here, but just, just over that ridge of hair right there is wing stem about seven foot tall. I think it's wing stem. I, it <coughs> might be uh, golden rod, but I think it's wing stem. Because I can only see it from the road. I just know it's got a yellow bloom on it. And uh, it is, you know, if it's my opinion, I want to I wanna bush hog it after the animals go through it, but we didn't get to it. So now it's blooming out and it's a mess. Um, but I like to hear other people's opinions. 
What are your bales weigh? You said you've had 117 out here? Uh, 700 pounds. 700 I weigh them. Yes, sir. So basically three to a time. Yes. Right. Yep. And what was the pH, Mike? Um, <coughs> the pH here was 6.1. Yeah, so decent pH. Yeah, it's yeah. not bad. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because you people people see broom sedge and see some of the plants we're going to look at and they say we need lime. That's just the standard recommendation from the neighbor, and uh, it's a lot of times it's phosphorus. It can be both, but it's it's just good to know what what your benchmark is. I was going to mention one more thing in that north field and even right here. We call it waxy weed, purple top, purple top, greasy grass, greasy grass. Okay. Let me tell you what, the animals will eat every bit of those seeds off of there and leave the stem. It's a native grass. Yeah, yeah. but they will eat every seed that you see right there. All right, who wants to start? Jim? Yep. The reason I asked about what the hay weighed, um, so seven acres here with 117 bales, or 115 bales, that's about 17 bales to the acre. That's 700 pounds. That's a little over five tons of hay fed per acre. Um, very often I see people actually overfeed hay and overload the nutrients here. So I'm going to go through some uh, real quick math here in terms of fertility. So a ton of hay on average is going to have 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen in it. High protein hay is going to be 50-ish. If you have really low protein hay, it'll be down around 30, but we'll go, we'll go with 40 and say that the protein was close to what the animal's needs were. Um, half of that, well, 90 plus percent of that nitrogen in the hay gets returned to the soil through dung and urine. And if the uh, protein content of the feed is approximately what the animals need, half of it is uh, in the urine, half is in the feces. Nitrogen in feces is slow-release nitrogen. Nitrogen um, in urine is immediately available. So f there would be 20 pounds of urinary nitrogen per ton, 20 pounds of fecal nitrogen. So feeding five tons of hay per acre, which is approximately what was done here, um, is putting 100 pounds of readily available nitrogen on the ground and that's part of why you see such a response to uh, feeding hay, you know, when the growing season resumes. A lot of that's a nitrogen response, and then we have slow release of nitrogen, you know, released over the next several months from the feces. Uh, all right, so if they had fed 10 tons of hay per acre out here, which a lot of folks do, that would have been 200 pounds of readily available or soluble nitrogen put on here and that is definitely overloading the system you would get nitrate leakage into the groundwater you'd have a lot more nitrogen in any, in any runoff following a uh, precipitation event i think feeding hay on degraded pasture land is one of the very best ways to jump start that land but you need to be aware of how much nutrients you're putting into the system. A ton of hay contains typically 12, 13 pounds of phosphate. So that five tons of hay also put uh, 60, 65 um, pounds per acre of phosphate down here. And that's also getting near the upper limit of what you would want to put down in one shot, especially if you're trying to um, create a, a healthier soil with mycorrhizal fungi because you need to have a low level of soluble phosphate available in the soil to get mycorrhizae to really kick in and go. So um, feeding hay on this is a real good idea, but uh, be judicious in how you use it. I'll just pass that along now. I've got a question for you, Jim. The, um... You know, we feed hay on the, on the lower quality land usually and but you know in precision ag they, they take care of the best land uh -huh. first so what about in, in grazing lands are we overlooking our best land when we feed on the lower quality land and uh... Uh, th that's a real good question and uh, the sad answer to that is most grazing lands in 
the U.S., certainly the eastern half of the U.S., are degraded enough that if you're importing hay, I think the priority is to uh, get some improvement on that most degraded land. If you look at, for instance, if we're talking phosphorus, the phosphorus response curve looks like this. You know, if we have soil test level across the bottom going from zero to 40, the response curve looks like this. And so the lower down you're working on the response curve, actually the bigger the bang for the buck of anything that you do apply to the soil. So I would be worried about getting these things that are, you know, testing three, four, five up to 12, 15 and not worry about getting anything put on where the soil, the phosphorus soil test is already, you know, 25, 30. That's good. Good answer. I, I'm going to comment back on, on kind of answer my own question too, in that if the cattle were out here, they're going to lay down on the higher, flatter spots. And when they stand up, what happened? Defecate, urinate, and there, there's our nutrients. So you, you, that's one reason for the paddocks is to get them to lay down in a different area. So I knew I could count on Greg to, uh, <clears throat> I want you to go through All what right. you have here. Okay. And so one of the things that we teach people to do is to observe, be highly observant. So as y'all walk from the buses out into the field, ideally you should have been observing everything out here and paying attention to everything because it all matters. So one of the things that Greg has done here is he's going to show us some some of the levels of diversity in here we're going to talk about that but one of the first things i do is i i start looking at and counting how many different species can i readily see now i'm i'm up to 23 already and i know that's not it yet yeah. because because i we haven't walked the whole area but just from walking from there to here and then looking around here and even just standing here greg i i picked up another four or five that i didn't oh, yeah. see walking in yeah. so so there's a minimum of 23 species that are in here right now and that matters that matters a lot again remember yesterday i talked about the need for diversity uh and and a little bit later this morning we'll talk about that a lot more but uh but the other thing that I'm going to pay attention to is I'm going to pay attention to what types of species are growing here. Okay, what are we seeing? I'm going to pay attention to the sounds. So am I hearing a lot of insects? That's really, really important. How many people have stood out in the middle of a monoculture crop field? Cornfield, soybean field, cotton field, whatever. What do you hear? Nothing. Very, very little, right? But when you come out into a highly diverse pasture, a rangeland, any prairie, then it's noisy, and it should be noisy. That, that's what you want. So I want to hear a cacophony of insects, and I want to hear birds, and I want to see birds, and I want to see, as I'm walking, I actually like to see clouds of insects rising above me. So you see, as I take these steps, insects are, are rising up out of the sward here and as you get into deeper swords you're going to see a lot more of them okay let me make a comment yeah. there i'm part of a study that alan is behind and uh and I, they they were looking at different farms and diversity and insects and all and they got to my farm and i had mowed <laughs> it was he, i said i said do you find anything and he says like a bomb went off <laughs> There's no insects. I can't find any. And the other farms that were regenerative, they found lots of them. But I, they told me just do what you've been doing, you know. And, and I messed up and mowed the day before they came to sweep for insects. So, so <laughs> mowing is a big impact. That's why I like to leave some uh, remnant areas whenever I mow. Some, uh, what do you call it? Res, res, uh, there's a word for it, but residual of areas for them to run into. How did you mow it? Mow it tight or high? Oh, it's mowed high. Yeah, yeah. It just, it just almost didn't matter. I mow about five or six inches. Yeah. There's two things in mowing. The lower you mow, 
the lower you mow, the more uh, weeds you're going to control. Of course, higher, you're going to leave more grass behind. So I usually let go mow two inches into the leaf. But note what he just said, okay? Even mowing high, insects moved out, right? But you're exactly correct in leaving that remnant habitat because they need a habitat to go into as that mowed area regrows and they, they, they can then move back into that. So, Greg, let's walk through some of the things that you notice. These are, low, these are low fertility, I tell you, Alan, you might just show one at a time and I, I can talk about it. Uh, butterfly milkweed, there's one blooming right over there. It's an orange flower, beautiful plant. They're an indicator that fertility is a little low or has been historically. Doesn't mean it's low today. They don't just disappear when we get our fertility right. They're still here. Uh, but this is a wonderful one for pollinator habitat and it's native. It's a cool plant. We'll go to the next one. Um, is that poisonous to sheep and goats? You know, it, it, a lot of the milkweeds are, so I'd say in the literature it is, but in reality it's not. So they'll, they'll eat it. They'll eat it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They'll eat it and they'll eat common milkweed. And they won't die. They're not going to die. Okay. I, I've, I've been around it enough. I don't know of any animals dying from milkweed. But, you. but you know, maybe there's an instance, but it would probably be monoculture milkweed. Uh, this is some kind of composite. It's a daisy and it's another one a, a, a indicator of lower fertility. Now you can see that this is responding to his management but it does show that there's been and when I say low fertility in this case we know it was phosphorus because he's done the soil testing. The state wildflower in Tennessee. Anybody? Yeah, may pop. Uh, passion flower, passion fruit, very expensive fruit. If you go to a high-end restaurant, they'll they'll make some things out of it, drinks and whatnot. And uh, but animals like it real well. It's yep. not a problem at at all. They'll the daisy, that. they're not going to eat that composite. Um, I forget what our first one was, but yeah, oh, the milkweed, milk they're going to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, beak panicum. I didn't know what this one was for a long time, but it's an indicator of lower fertility. They'll eat it. Again, they're going to eat most everything in a vegetative state. When it gets like this, they're going to go around it and not do much with it. Uh, here's the tridents or greasy grass uh, that Mike talked about to begin with. It's purple. Yeah, here it is right here. And it doesn't have a lot of leaf area on it, but there's different ecotypes. There, there's some that do. And, the way they select for natives is, is just a collection and then they do a trials and compare them and they try to get an ecotype that has better leafiness if that's what they're selecting for. And our old favorite should be the state grass of Tennessee, broom sedge. And it's not a sedge, broom sage. It's Andropogon virginicus. Uh, it's, uh, I think it was, was it Jim that talked about him, them eating yeah. it at six inches? They love it in the spring. Well, I shouldn't say love, but they eat it well. And actually, that's a real good time if you want to get control of it. Hammer it. Graze it really hard in the spring. Um, and it's just going to fall out of the system. It'll be less and less of it because it gets outcompeted by other grasses over time. Uh, one thing, lay down in a field of broom sedge in the winter and you'll you'll have great windbreak i mean it's just a lot warmer down under there and it's good for things like quail nesting habitat there's there's value to all of these plants in another aspect and in regenerative ag we think of the whole so always consider all of those things whenever you're doing your management red clover see the hair on the stem we can pass that one around if anybody wants to look at it um it um, it's adapted to somewhat lower fertility. It'd be uh, it can exist uh, and be more productive with the fertility balanced. Um, it's a biennial kinda. Uh, it's a reseeding biennial. It's it, it lasts two or three years. Some of the literature says if you buy certified seed, it'll last three years, and if it's not certified, it'll be two years. And you can let it go to seed and it'll come back over time. So uh, in grazing, we can manage to, to keep it longer sometimes. I, I might make a comment yeah, on yeah. that because 
when we first started out uh, on the farm in Missouri, um, we were overseeding red clover, white clover, uh, mostly red clover, um, every, almost every other year. And then we went to where we did one third of the farm each year. But where we ended up was allowing a long enough recovery period, which is 65, 70 days, to let the clover naturally reseed. And that's where we started um, actually in Idaho. And so we moved on to the ranch in the fall of 04. In spring of um, 06, we overseeded red clover, alcyc clover, and white clover. So that was in 06. That is the last time we have put a clover seed on that place. Again, we allow one third of the uh, irrigated land there, a uh, long recovery period to make seed. And so let's see, that is uh, what, 16 years ago now? It's been 16 years since we've reseeded clover uh, mechanically. And all of these, uh, the, the annual Espedeza, red clover, uh, vetches, all of these, if you allow a long enough recovery period, they will naturally reseed. So as a replacement for your nitrogen fertilizer, yeah, legumes is the way to go. Um, and whereas 30 years ago, I thought it was a recurring expense that, you know, you had something every year you were putting into overseeding. All you have to do is manage it and it'll be there. Yeah, I, I did like Jim, I, and it's, then I went to half rates, and now I just do certain fields, and I still seed half rates. Uh, the full rate of white clover is two pounds per acre. We had a contract, my wife had a contract with the NRCS, and they had a typo in it, it said 31 pounds per acre. <laughs> Be your own advocate. You know, look at things and make sure that you, that the writing is correct. Now that was in Kentucky, not Tennessee, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, so, uh, uh, and then the red clover is is the full rate. If it was just in the mix, usually it's two pounds, four pounds of red clover, and then eight pounds of annual lespedes on the thin ground. The full rate of red clover is more like ten to twelve pounds per acre. Um, but anyway. Um, like Jim says, if we get the management right, get the rest right, it's got a lot of hard seed in it. Those they hang around for a long time. So, so uh, if it's ever had clover, it's likely to come back. Yeah, Johnson grass. Um, it's uh, it's probably my favorite grass. It's uh, perennial sorghum. It really is a sorghum. And if you're going to plant. Sudex or savan grass, why in the world wouldn't you want this? I'm on farms all the time and they're trying to kill this and they've got, they're even grazing it. And it's like, gosh, that's just, it's a crop mentality, you know. So, um, yeah, so it can be grazed out. In continuous grazing, you don't see it very often um, or at all. And then if you rest it needs about 60 days rest to really maybe 45 i mean you can, it depends on the growing season but if you rest it over 90 days it can shade out other grasses so um, just and we've got the cyanide people worry so much about the cyanide um it's it dissipates in it so it after a killing frost it's about 14 days and and it's gone that's a conservative estimate really it might be gone in four or five days uh, some people don't worry about it and they hadn't had problems and others are scared to death of it. So I've, we've had a few die from it in the, over, that's probably 40, 50 years ago, but we did have some die from Johnson grass. It's most toxic when it's little. It's more toxic than sedan grass. We, you can do cyanide tests, but I, I wouldn't, I don't advise it. You know, in this part of the world, you rarely will a drought cause cyanide poisoning. What about nitrates? Greg? Nitrates are the other side of poison, and and um, you know, in a biological system, you're rarely going to have nitrate uh, trait issues. Um, now, Jim, if we had that 10 tons per acre put on here, it'd be slow release, but still, it might be enough to cause that issue. Um, yeah, nitrates hang around in it. You know, so if we cut it for hay and it's nitrate, it'll be in the hay and it's toxic forever. 
the uh, cyanide dissipates whether it's cut for hay or not. So you don't have to worry about it in grazing. Um, or hay, the if, cyanide. If, they did, if there was just some scattered throughout your field, though, would they, would they, they bother cattle? Or no, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, it'd be... It's like a cherry limb. It has cyanide in it too, and I'm sure we can spot a cherry here real easy. But uh, anyway, uh, when the limb is leaves are wilted, they have cyanide, and it's poisonous too. But they're dry leaves and green leaves are not toxic. Anyway, the point of the the limb is, if only two cattle find it, they may die. If the whole herd gets it, they're not going to die because they're you know it's not enough. So it has do with the mouth consumed. Um, it's very toxic and it's odorless and uh, tasteless so they don't know they're uh, consuming a toxin. Cyanide's the only one that you get, I get concerned about because all the other toxins, the animals can discern them and uh, that I know of and they, they avoid them if they have something else to eat. All right. Nimble wheel, wheel. I need to stop this one. Uh, that looks like Bermuda grass, but if you can pull it up, it's not Bermuda grass. And see that straight seed head? That's not Bermuda. Bermuda has the three prong, four prong uh, seed head. And um, yeah, this one is a real, is a one to watch. Um, it's a bad one. We want to put the mineral feeder on this one. We want to stomp this out and we want to keep um, keep plants above it. You can't shade it out because it's so shade tolerant. You just live with it uh, if you've got it. Um, any other, any, Jim, you, you've dealt with this nimble wheel. It's it's a Muhlenbergii, right? So Yeah, um, I've dealt with it very little because in, in North Missouri we did not have that. Okay. Um, when I was in grad school at University of Kentucky Take some you know, with you, I bet it'll go grow there. <laughs> at Kentucky, it was all over. Yeah. And of course, Idaho, it, it, it is a warm season or a cool season? Warm season. All right. See, one of the things that, about Idaho is we have no warm season there. So we have no warm season grasses. So I could take this whole wad to Idaho, throw it out on the ground, and we'd never see a spring. That's a good point. Different locations like reed canary grass goes nuts up north it'll grow on ridges and uplands and take over everything down here it'll only grow in the wet areas well russ where you are it'll it'll grow pretty well anywhere right oh yeah yeah yep. yeah and it's a good grass i don't want to get off on other grasses but it, it'll grow it's a good grass if it's kept vegetative <coughs> very productive grass. oh yeah um but nimble wheel oh this thing is one that increases because the animals don't like it. My animals eat it somewhat now. Now, not at this stage so much, but when it's vegetative, they'll, they'll eat it pretty good. And you can grow clovers in it. And the very best thing I've found for it is Johnson grass. Uh, Johnson grass gets above it, and so it, they just coexist. Uh, and, and I feel like it reduces the the vitality of the nimble wheel and then other things come in. Um, in Tennessee, I visited with the uh, regulatory people, what are they called? Uh, anyway, and the state law, seed law, is that you can't contaminate seed with Johnson grass. And, uh, but that's a seed law. It's not that you can't plant it. It's that you cannot contaminate other seed with it. So she was very good, Annie Self. And I visited with her about three or four times because I wanted to be sure that that I knew what I was I was advising y'all correctly. And you can plant Johnson grass here. Uh, you just um, yeah, you just can't contaminate other seed. Really. You can buy Johnson grass. You can buy it. Yeah, yeah. You can't buy it in Kansas. Yeah, yeah. some yeah, so different what states. What is it you don't like about the nimble wheel? Is it that they just don't eat it? They just don't eat it. Yeah, they don't eat it, and it takes over, and other stuff that doesn't grow through it very well. Very wiry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you, there's always exceptions, but thinner grasses aren't really loved by animals, like love grass and, uh, I don't know, there's there's a lot of thinner leaf grass. Now, bluegrass is kind of an exception to that. But. What if we were to bunch our cattle up on that 
Craig. Yeah, yeah. So stomping the heck out of it, high density, short duration grazing, they would consume it, and <clears> then we they'd stomp it as well. And it's one that I would turn in on wet, Mike. I saw Mike a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. If it was a wet day, I'd want to pug that one. I'd just, I'd just annihilate it. I don't like it. I don't like this one either. This is wing stem, or well, I call it wing stem. It's really stick weed in the literature, but it's got a flange on the stem, and uh, animals don't like it either. Is it a um, silphium? No, it's not a silphium. Okay. Um, hmm. I have trouble keeping up with that. Uh, what family it's in? Genus. Um, but um, it's also called crown springer. Good for pollinators. Um, it breaks real super easy. I've run a culture packer over it, trying to get some kind of control, but it's a perennial. You, that's not going to do much for it. Uh, this is the one that you'd have to mow five times a year to make much headway on. It, and <coughs> of course, that's kind of overkill. But. So how not do you far, control? Though. Not what? far, because I just mowed mine three weeks ago. It's already this tall, and it's yeah. got the yellow blooms on it. Yep, and the, the main thing is don't let the leaves smother everything else. It'll kill stuff underneath it, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do you control it? It's real well, that, that mowing is one way of, um, uh, you know, you, you could use a high-powered spray and get it. All the perennials take the high-powered sprays, and I, I did, I've gotten out of the herbicides enough. Just go to the weed control manual, call it stick weed or wing stem, and, and it'll show you how to, what to do. Is high density rotating and improving the, the soil that's gonna it's gonna peter out a little bit? A little. Or is it gonna take <laughs> It's over? a perennial yeah. and it's perennials are tough. One of the things that I would do, we're not really messing with this too much up in our area, but a lot one of the first uh, management tools that you have in your toolbox is your livestock and you wanna try and do everything that you can with your livestock because if you get on the tractor, it's you know, ultimately costing you too much whenever you're able to do it with your livestock. And whenever I come into a weed situation or an under, not necessarily, I don't like to call them <coughs> weeds anymore because we're, we're consuming a lot of what we used to call weeds. Um, the first thing that I recommend or try is make long skinny paddocks yeah. and keep the water in and keep a back fence on them. You know, you may, you're going to say, well, this is not uh, going to work or it's going to take too much time. If, say, this whole field was, was wing stem, I would take this field and I would, I would split it long ways and make maybe 10 foot, 15 foot wide alleyways and keep water into those paddocks. And I think that you could make headway or, or, or most weeds that I've, I've dealt with or dealt with on other farms you can make some headway if you can get them set back enough to get your grasses and other plants starting to grow underneath them a little yeah. bit. Good point. All right, the next one here, chicory. There's a forage chicory that has more leaves on it. This one doesn't have so many leaves. Again, it's somewhat an indicator that fertility is off a little, but not not a strong indicator. You'll see it on other lands. Um, it can smother or it can get too too thick. We've seen we've been on some farms together, Mike, where the chicory was too thick. Um, it's very stemmy, and that's not a good characteristic. Now the forage chicory has got a lot more leaf and and um, more palatable. I, I would look at it as a benefit, though. I wouldn't on this. I think this is a great dispersion of it, and uh, it's. Some of the literature says it's a natural dewormer, others says it's not. Uh, it's volatile oils, it's not tannins in this one. Um, so, uh, it, it adds to the landscape here. Yeah, plantain, whoops, sorry, I made a mess of it. It's so shallow rooted they didn't get the root. Um, uh, but the plantains do have tannins in them and they are a natural dewormer. And sheep and goats eat them better than cattle, but cattle eat them too. Um, I, I, I don't like them when they go flat. I want them to be upright, reaching through grass. When they go flat, they seem to do that all allelopathic thing and start taking over areas. You usually see them in hay fields worse than anywhere, and you can get a lot of this through hay because a lot of times it's what grows in the fall. 
uh, with their seed heads. Uh, rib grass, is, I think, is what they call it in some of the European literature. And that's, of course, the... Yeah, there's the seed, seed head. head. Yeah, yeah, that's the seed head. You used to shoot those as a kid. Yep, <laughs> yep. Foxtail, green foxtail or yellow foxtail. Um, yeah, you can see how it did that little swirl here at the bottom. Um, it's okay until it goes to seed. And then at this point, it's they're not going to do much with it. And People get real concerned about it. And it can get too thick, but in general, it's just a component of the land. Um, not not a whole lot we can do about this one. Um, and now again, if it gets thick, you could do some special things like Russ just described to control it. But um, it, it's an annual. This one is so um, so we we could have more cover when it's germinating, and that would be germinating in probably June. Is that a mature plant? It is. That is as tall as it's going to get. This one. Okay. Yeah. So that's now, probably the one I got in my pasture. Yeah. Sheep, they don't want to. They don't want to mess with it. Not at this point. Right. Well, even her, younger, I, they don't think. Don't think they're it. eating. Sheep can select better than cattle, so you might tighten them up, and maybe they will eat it a little better. Um, they may have too much good, other good to eat, you know. Ironweed. Um, you know, the purple bloom. Oh, let's see. Cattle avoid it, so it's an increaser. And I've seen lands taken over by it, but it's kind of unusual. And usually it's an upright, not creating a lot of shade. Goats love it. Sheep like it. Cattle don't touch it uh, in general. Now, again, with the high density grazing, they're going to take it. Oh, yeah, it goes away. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. It's got a. It, you think when you see these big, tall uprights, you think they all have tap roots. This one doesn't have a tap root. It's kind of like my fingers going down. But it's a different root structure and a benefit to the soil structure. But uh, I don't have a lot to say about this one. Uh, you know, it, mowing would be the the way that I would control it if I if I had it to an extent. I don't have much of it because I got sheep. All right. I think we've made it through those. Hey, Greg, before you get off and read, if you don't mind just mentioning one thing on your phone, there are read IDs on here. I've got iNaturalist. Dan's got uh, Google, Google works good, too. Google, Leaf Snap, there's a bunch of good ones. Yeah. The grasses are a little harder than the than the broad leaves. Here's one. Oh, I didn't cover this one. Dallas grass. Yeah, Dallas grass. Some of the literature said on uh, that Dallas grass wouldn't grow in this area. Well, that they missed it there. Uh, Dallas grass has quite a story. Um, it's uh, it's a warm season. It carries the ergot. It can carry the ergot. It's orange or real black sooty. Uh, in general, don't worry about it. But if you see a lot of orange seed heads out there, I'm going to say 20% of them are orange. I would clip it before I grazed it. Um, ergot it can cause ergot poisoning, and it kind of goes make it does make them go mad. It's um, ergot of rye is another ergot, and it's what actually was the, the witches, witches were really consuming rye bread that had ergot in it. That was the problem. So, uh-oh, we kind of screwed up there, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so just watch out, be observant again, and if they're orange, uh, do something about it before you graze too much of it. What was that called? Dallas grass. Dallas grass. It's a good warm season that usually is volunteered. Nobody planted it, probably. It just came in. It's got its legs where it wants to grow. Yeah. It is just that. It legs compacted. It does. It comes compact. in where it's been grazed close, usually, at some point. But once it's there, it's going to be there for a while, probably. What are you talking about? The orange. The seed you're head. Always, you're not always going to see orange seed head. No. no. You do see orange seed head. Yeah, that's the ergot. That, that comes later, and, and that has a, 
so when you see the ergot and, and it's turn and it's really sort of a rust color, okay? Uh, but it but it's very very evident when you see that across patches of Dallas grass, and typically you see it when you've had a little bit of weather anomaly in the middle of the summer, uh, particularly if you if you have been very hot, but then all of a sudden you start getting rain and it gets very steamy, very humid. That's when you're going to see that sort of explode in in this uh, Dallas grass and. And Greg is exactly right. I mean, it, it uh, you know, it, it, it makes cattle crazy. They, they act drunk, and, and it can kill them if they get too much of it. And people have bailed this up into hay, just like the nitrates in the hay. It stays there forever if you put it up in the hay. And you can kill cattle. I've seen people kill cattle in the wintertime, feeding them hay bailed from uh, higher got uh, Dallas grass fields in the summertime. It's got alkaloids in it too, so just like fescue, it can cause fescue foot yep. and tails to slough. I've only seen that on about two farms, but uh, it's bad when it hits your farm and you want to get them off of all alkaloids whenever that happens. So, you know, there's a big push in silver pasture, and I love silver pasture. This is persimmon tree, and there's a number of them out here. Uh, Mike, are they consuming them pretty good? or? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, they'll eat that good this is persimmon and uh I, there's also uh i don't know what happened to it but i collected a yeah some, i missed some of my weeds here but um uh, but yeah persimmon you know they're they used to make golf clubs out of them they're real hard wood they're usually straight trees they're a fruit tree a lot of a lot of benefits to them so since they eat them they're not going to get out of control um so they, he might want to select a few of them. He leaves a little shade out here, in my opinion, so I might just select some of them and let them go. Just mow around them or try to protect them and, uh, and let them go. Uh, now, one we don't want to let go is the Bradford pear or calorie pear, and I had a collection of it here. Yeah, you'll see it out here. And, uh, you know, all the fruit trees look a little similar, but this one has thorns. It's bad news. Uh, you do not want this. And if you watch and if you're observing again, just uh, look at landscapes that hadn't been managed over the last 10 years, and you'll see a lot of these in there. It's a very invasive plant. It's from, come from the root stock. And then I had a, the uh, rose, yeah, there we go. Well, there's a set, uh, spurge. This one's a spurge, and it's another indicator that fertility is a little low. Uh, now, again, I wouldn't be concerned about that one. I've seen big masses of it, but in general, it's just splattered across the pasture. Here it is. The multiflora rose. This one has rose rosette. It's going to die. Might be a slow death, but it's it's got a virus. And thrips eat this one, and then they, since they have a puncture mouth, they go to the next plant and they give it inoculate the next rose with it. So if you were spraying, I'd re recommend not spraying this one and let that propagate and kill other roses naturally. All right, we'll move on to somebody else here. Oh, I do have a question. I did see some ground cherry coming across the pasture. Okay, was, um, it, was it horse nettle? Horse or? nettle, I saw Oh, was it I horse nettle? Yeah. Okay, because I yeah, said they actually had a cherry right here. Okay, okay, yeah. Probably horse nettle in this area. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. here we go. Okay. So they're, they're, yeah, I've seen it scattered around as we walked in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask a question on the rose? Yeah. Can I, is there a natural name? I've got a lot of wild rose. Mm -hmm. uh, it's different variety than that. This can is multi-floor rose. Can I, kill, can I kill it with something naturally? I, you know, I would just collect something like this and, and grow this one in your area. Take this one with you and plant it and keep an eye on it and uh, don't let it bloom. And, and then they will have that virus in your area. And then your roses around the house will die too. <laughs> 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 you know, my roses around the house die well. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. okay. We we have a lot of the multiflower rose up in our area, and one of the things that I've found that opens them up and makes them more susceptible to the to the virus. That's the oh the rose. The, the rose, yes. Um, if you can graze them multiple times a year, 
if uh, you get them, I found if I can graze them with the sheep or the cows, my cows will take probably the top 10, 12 inches off of them that, that year's growth. And if I can hit them three to four times, probably better than 50% of those roses are going to die. Yeah, when yeah. I, I used to have 300 goats and I wanted to keep a, a rose about this high mm -hmm. because they have tannins in them, they're natural dewormers, so there's some value to them in that regard. Now, the, the multiplier rose, it can get big. You know, when I first moved to my farm, I had multiplier rose 30 feet round and 30 feet high, and, you know, it was really bad. And the way I controlled it naturally is set a bale of hay in the center of it or put your mineral tub in the center of it. Um, you know, your livestock. Will... Oh, yeah, you can knock it down with a no till drill, absolutely. Um, but it's there, you're not going to get rid of it, so you're just better off to probably just deal with it. Um, you know, you're going to spray it, but if you're going to spray it, it's going to be back. You know, so it's, it's better just to manage it than to try eradicate it. And another, I wanted to touch on the chicory that Greg had talked about. I showed a slide yesterday where a chicory root. It went down into the soil 48 inches in six months. Was it forage chicory? No, no. Actually, I planted uh, just native. just native chicory because um, it stays better than forage chicory. Chic forage chicory is a very, very short-lived plant. That's going to be like it, way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, two years on a forage chicory and you're doing really good. So it, I just wanted to touch on those couple plants. Greg's going to talk about the horse nettle. Uh, we have that on our farm, and, and it's pretty prevalent around. Uh, it can be toxic, but we've grazed some pretty thick patches of horse nettle. The cows will eat it, um, at least my cows. Now, if you're not in a high stock density system, if you have the berries on it and you have sheep, those sheep will go out through the field and you can hear them popping those berries in their mouth. Yeah, it's just like just if you are to eat... Uh, uh, cherry tomatoes, right. you know how they pop in their mouth? Same family. S same, yeah, it is the same family. So, here, Greg. I wanted to tell a little something on, on conservation. See, I worked for NRCS or soil conservation for years. You can tell how good the conservationist was back in the 50s and 60s by how much multiflora rose and kudzu is in your neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> John A. Peef got a question. Okay. John A. Peef. Hey, hey, the little lace. I don't know if you talked about buttercup. No, we hadn't. Yeah, how are you? I have a lot of that. I wanted to ask you that question. I have one more question after you answer that. All right, let's just talk about buttercup first, and then we'll go back to the horse nettle. Um, yeah, buttercup, uh, it's an indicator of low oxygen, so all usually wetness or compaction, and somewhat overgrazing, uh, close grazing. I hear farmers all the same time say, I've just got to spray every other year or something like that. And, of course, you don't. Um, sheep love buttercup. And there's several buttercups, but the main one is bulbous buttercup in this area. Um, um, yeah, so buttercup is one we just need more cover. It's germinating right now. Uh, you don't have buttercup out here, Mike, I don't believe. Uh, no. Uh -huh. But... But if, if he did, we could find it germinating in some bare spots right now. Um, Greg, it's, do, you, yeah. do you know if there's a fertility relationship? I, I can't relate fertility to it. I just, I, I think it's low oxygen. There, it, you know, it could be a, a early indicator like this greasy grass. It's an early indicator of, of low fertility. It doesn't mean it's totally out of whack, but it's on the low end of, of fertility. A phosphorus or pH, um, but uh, that's about all I've got on buttercup. You know, ryegrass is just a tremendous grass on those areas. If you had a lot of buttercup, but the main thing is is raising the grazing height, uh, especially in the early spring and the fall. It germinates in early spring and fall, so uh, we need we need more cover. Okay, back to horse nettle. Uh, you see these little holes in it. It, that's flea beetle damage. It's a secondary host for flea beetles. That's powdery mildew on the leaf. So, you know, and it's a perennial. It's got a real knotty uh, root that looks like ginseng. Um, this is a bad dude. This is the one in, in uh, pastures where they use herbicides. They, 
that they bring out the big ammo because it won't die with one spray. Even of the powerful stuff, usually they recommend two sprays, I believe. So uh, it's a summer weed. It goes to seed right now, and you'll see the little yellow cherries on it. Um, some people tell me they get pretty good control mowing in the fall, but this is when we're trying to grow grass, so it's an awkward position we're in, uh, knocking it back. This year in my area, and I think here too, it's been warm. We're still trying to stay ahead of warm seasons to release the cool seasons. Next week looks like our cool season growth is going to begin. So it's time to get all these warm seasons under control, maybe move fast. We've had fast growth, so fast moves. Let's get ahead of the warm seasons and then let's back off and tighten up and try to grow more cool season. Greg, I have one more question. I want to go back to the brome grass that you showed earlier. The what? Brome? Yeah. Uh, broom sedger. Broom sedger is yeah. what I mean. Yeah, if you have a, a prolific stand on it, and you don't have the infrastructure of fencing and water, and you're trying to uh, move away from it, and, you, and you're on a shell base, would you say that planting the, the root-bound plants in uh, the, the cool season, uh, turnips and radishes and veg and all that sort of stuff in it to try to get organic matter up, that's yeah we got to get the fertility up that's the that's the main point we can stomp it out we can do whatever but if we didn't get the fertility improved we're we're not going to make big strides uh that's yeah so whatever it takes to get the fertility improved on that land is what it's going to take and then raise your grazing height if, if it is low it may not necessarily be low with the broom sedge but uh and and that will help too to smother it out and also make, I would because they'll eat it better if the fertility is correct. Yeah. One of the plants that is pretty common in the East Coast is uh, Canadian thistle. Is it, um, we don't have much of it, we got some. Canadian thistle can be a problem. Um, but it can be controlled by grazing. We, it's pretty pro prolific up where we're at. And if you graze it whenever the soils, you say you got just got a half inch rain or something, not necessarily pug it up, but uh, when you're moving across the pasture, you have a patch, but it kind of grows in a patch and it will shade out all the grasses underneath. And the way to control it is if you're coming across the pasture, just do a high stock density graze on it, um, throw a throw a poly fence around it just big enough to hold your cows, let them there for 20 minutes and then let them back out into the paddock. And that sets the, the Canadian thistles back enough that the other grasses can come through. You're not going to kill the Canadian thistles. It's like the other plants. Um, it's there. You're not going to get rid of it. So, you know, want, you'll work with it. Um, but you can really set the Canadian thistle back just by doing a high stock density graze and having a little extra moisture in the soil. Mike was saying there's some water in the back of that truck if anybody needs water. So, so uh, I'll just share what we do. There's, there's not a plant here I'm worried about, to be honest with you, not a single one. Um, and I want as much diversity as I can possibly have. Whether my livestock eat a ton of it or not is not the question here. The question is, what is it doing for my ecosystem, okay? And a lot of these plants are critically important for pollinators and a lot of beneficial insects. I want those. They're also critical for birds. I want those. Yeah, so, so there's not anything that I want to eliminate. Yesterday I told you, I shared with you that I've already documented we have more than 140 different plant species growing in our pastures. Uh, in Alabama and Mississippi, and we didn't plant, we did not plant any of those. Now, some of those are things that people planted prior to our ownership, okay? But the vast majority, they didn't plant either. We've documented more than eight dozen different native species that have come back from the seed bank, okay? But I'm going to be, I'm going to trend a lot more towards Russ here in that my livestock are my key tool, okay? 
I'm never going to crank a tractor if I don't have to, and especially now. You know, diesel just is super expensive in repair, maintenance, depreciation, everything else. So if I don't have to crank a piece of equipment, equipment I'm absolutely not going to do that uh, for any reason. Uh, it has to be a very strong reason for me to crank a tractor. The only piece of equipment we crank on a daily basis is a buggy for fencing and, and building paddocks and moving livestock, and that's it. You know, there, there's nothing else we crank on a daily basis. Uh, I'm going to use the livestock, and, and we have multi-species of livestock, and I'm going to challenge everybody here today quite honestly, if you only have one species of livestock, why? Why? What's your reason for only having one species of livestock? You're limiting what you can do. You're limiting your ecology, your biology. You're limiting your diversity. You're limiting your revenue potential if you only have one species of livestock. Same thing if you're, you're a row cropper and on a given acre you only plant corn and you do nothing else to generate revenue that year. Why in the heck are you doing that? It's usually because of fence. Yeah, because of fence or lack of fence? Lack of. Lack yes. of fence, right. <laughs> so what makes me money, if I'm, a li if I'm in a livestock operation, tell me the three key things that make me money. And don't list any piece of heavy metal because that doesn't. Anything that rusts and you put fuel in and you crank it does not make you money. Okay. okay. So tell me the three things that make me money. Forage. <laughs> okay. Fence, water, and livestock. Fence, water, and livestock. Okay. The livestock are my units of profit. They are my units of revenue generation. And to generate revenue from them, I need fence and I need water. So fencing and water are not an expense. They are an investment. And if we have areas we can't graze appropriately because of lack of water or lack of fence, we're making the wrong choices in how we spend our money. Okay? I'm just, and I'm just being very blunt about that. You're making the wrong choices in how you're spending your dollars. Spend your dollars on the things that are going to make you money, not the things that are going to rust and depreciate and require fuel, all of those types of things. So put in the fence and the water. But we, what we do, again, is using multi... Do you know how many things here that pastured pigs can control? For instance, the horse nettle. Greg, what did you say about the roots of a horse nettle? Look like ginseng. Okay. You know the pigs leak the heck out of that? Okay. I've heard them crunching on uh, blackberry roots, too. You know? uh, that's right. So if I want to... if I want to, Now, I don't want to deplete and totally eliminate horse nettle because it has value and benefit in my ecosystem, okay? But I want to control it. I don't want it to be dominant in that landscape. So I'm going to look at the different species of livestock that I can incorporate and be able to utilize to help me in that regard, as well as, you know, the grazing that I'm going to do with the cattle, the sheep, and so forth. The... The ironweed right here, our cattle will strip every single leaf off of this. Every darn leaf. They'll, they'll strip it down bare, and they'll definitely control ironweed. Now, how many of you have ironweed? How many of you have dog fennel? Okay. Sheep. Do you know what sheep do with these? Okay, sheep will actually prune and groom these plants. Our sheep go out there and they target, if there's any dog fennel out there, if there's any ironweed out there, they'll target this and they'll graze it down to a certain height so that it grows back out real bushy instead of stemmy and tall. It grows like a low bush. you got to hit it at the right time once it's above that, that, That's right. you got to hit it at the right time. So observation and timing is critical in controlling any of these plants in here. Timing is crucial. Very crucial. A absolutely, but but what does it take to hit that? You got to observe, don't you, Greg? And observe regularly. So they'll come groom these things, 
and create them, turn them into little bushes, and then they come back to them and eat the heck out of them. They love them when they're really, really bushy like that. So they intentionally prune and groom these things to create dining for themselves in the future. So it's amazing what each individual species will do when you start to pay attention. And like Russ said, long paddock configuration and a lot of times even paddock direction matters. It matters a lot. So if I, I can have the same stock density and the same acres contained within a paddock, but if I make that paddock configuration long and narrow, rectangular versus square, I'm going to get totally different type of utilization out of it by my livestock, even under the same acreage and the same stock density. They're not going to impact it the same way. So if I need to much more heavily impact something and I'm wanting to, you know, start to outcompete plants like this, the stickweed and all of that, okay, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a long, narrow paddock through there. How do they move in a long, narrow paddock? They don't got one way they really can move, right? Yeah. Back and forth, back and forth like this. You're going to get a much, much higher degree of trample. In a square paddock, how do they move? Move like this. Exactly. So I don't get near the degree of trample. So, so the shape of the paddock matters if we're trying to control something. Somebody said it earlier. I, th I think it was Greg, but I agree with that too. Strategically use your water. Strategically use your minerals. All salt blocks, anything like that. If you've got an area you're trying to get under control and get other plants to grow to outcompete it, place the mineral feeder right smack dab in the middle. Place the water trough right smack dab in the middle. And while we're at water, I want to say one thing about that. And uh, I'm sure I know Jim's worked tons with water, Russ and Greg and all of this. I'll let them, but I'll tell you what we do. They can share what they do and what they favor. But there's, there's several key things we do. First is when we put in what we install water lines, everything is always, we're going to have risers with quick couplers, okay, always. And we like to put a riser every five to 600 foot. That just gives us so many more options. Now, we do not anymore, we have some permanent trawls, but we never... I've gone completely away from that. When I put in new water line, I never put in a permanent trough. I just don't do that anymore. We have a riser halfway between here and the road and halfway between here and the woods. Yep, there you go. So you can look at that. So we and we like to recess our, our, our risers in the ground and inside of a corrugated culvert sleeve, and we put a shut off on every one. So that way, you know, it's easy to go down and turn them off. We don't have to shut the water off to everything if we have an issue and got to repair a line somewhere. Uh, but we like portable trawls now. So everything is portable. And it's super easy to move these trawls. Uh, you know, we just, we, we basically fabricate a little, a little basket for them, so to speak. You know, with the chain welded onto that, you can throw it over the receiver hitch of your ATV or UTV. And that gives me a lot more options versus permanent water. So I can, when I'm back to a riser, I can put my water trough, the portable water trough, right at the riser if I want to. Or I can hook in hose and I can go out in a radius, 100 foot, 200 foot, whatever I want to do, all around. So every time I'm back in at that riser, my water trough is at a different point, so I never have a heavy beat up, you know, heavy use area, right? So we, we don't have that anymore, and it also prevents cow paths. If you've got a permanent trough, even if you're moving cattle a lot in paddocks, you're still going to have cow paths, and they're going to become permanent. So being able to move them around like that prevents the formation of permanent cow paths and those types of things. Uh, now, just a little helpful hint here, okay? when when you move your water trials we we unscrew the plug at the bottom to let them drain don't let that get out of your hand as soon as you unscrew it you throw it inside the water trough okay and then when we unhook the coupling hose don't let it get out of your hand throw it immediately inside the water trough 
That way you don't lose the plugs, you don't lose the coupling hoses. They're always right there in the trough and you know where they are. And we move the water before we build the paddocks and move the cattle, especially in the summertime. Because if it's really hot and all of that, what's the worst thing that can happen? Them not to have water when they move into a new paddock. It, 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 it makes them crazy up here, okay? You, you don't want that. And then they're fearful every time. The water's the first thing they think about every time. Yeah, Jim? The uh, way we deal with that is for every herd, I like to have two tanks. And so uh, last thing in the evening that we will do is turn off the water where they are, and they'll drink that out overnight. Then in the when, morning when you move them, you have the other tank already set and full in uh, that next paddock. And because I, I like to have my fence set the, the day before so that when I go out there, all I have to do is move them because too often I've seen them. They, they see you out there setting up that next fence or moving water, and yeah, they're just marching back and forth. So uh, movable tanks basically are cheap. So get two of them and already have one set up for the next move. Now, Jim, you I first thought you were saying two in the same tank, no. but you're talking about one. All, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've gotten where I'm using a, a second water tank in the same paddock, and I'm amazed how much more water they drink. I think we're underestimating the water that we potential water intake. Well, NRCS underestimated water intake as long as I've seen any of their data. Yeah. It is it, it's too gross low. underestimation in most environments. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing similar, similar as Jim and, and Dr. Alan Williams. Uh, we're using frost-free hydrants on our farm. Uh, when we put them in, it was suggested to put a stabilized area around it. The tanks never buy the water hydrants, so why should we waste that land and put a stabilized area around it? Because we're, we're moving the tank with, with the livestock at all times. And we also run, we run three tanks on ours and uh, they don't cost hardly anything. You know, you want to talk about low cost. I use a 55 gallon drum cut at 19 inches and I have a high flow valve in it and I have a valve protector and I'm gonna show a picture of it later this afternoon. The valve's like 27 bucks. You can get the, the, the barrel for just about nothing. I can water 120 animal units out of that and the key but behind that is it's close enough to the cows where the whole herd doesn't come to it all at once. And high flow valve. You, with a high flow valve, and you, I like to see at least four gallons per minute flow. Um, if you get below that, if you're gravity flow, you may want to have to go with a bigger tank. But I like the smaller tank because I can just flip it over and go. I can throw it in the back of the side by side. Oftentimes, I don't even unhook it from the garden hose. I just grab a hold of it, drive the side by side the next, and but oftentimes I'll have two set ahead. And, and like Jim says, I've had cows until I learned to have that paddock set in the morning. You have a rain during the night, you don't have that paddock when you go out there in the morning. There's a good chance by the time you get that set fence, that fence set and those cows moved, you're gonna have a pugged up area along that fence where they ran back and forth on it. And another thing that we have noticed we don't always have water in with them when we move them. Now, if we're moving them to another field, that's when we got to have water because we're just, you know, we're just we use we're we're smaller. So whenever we move them, the tanks usually along the fence, and we can flip it into the next paddock. So I guess you could say, almost say that they have water whenever they move in. But if we're moving across the farm, even if we go a quarter of a mile, it seems like the whole herd wants to drink whenever they get there for for whatever reason. So. It is a great idea to have water in there, and by the time you get there, if you don't have it, you don't. You get there, it may take you 15, 20 minutes to get set up. Then you have a problem. You're going to sit there and wait for the for them to get done if you don't have a big enough water tank, because they're probably going to flip it over and drag it through the pasture and do all kinds of fun things that they do with water tanks. Yeah, so it's got to be full when they get in there. Yeah. Yeah. That the biggest mistake you can make is is turning them in and your trough's just starting to fill. You know, that needs to be completely full when they get in. Now, so, and we work with a lot of very large ranches in the Western U.S., uh, and they're running mobs of three to four to 5,000 head. 
including bison. Uh, so we work with some of the largest bison ranchers out there. And uh, so high flow valves are critical, but the other thing is not, you don't want, exactly, you do not want a big trough, okay? It's not about getting a whole bunch to drink at one time. As a matter of fact, that's counterproductive in what you're wanting to do. You want to train them to come to water in small groups. But the key is they'll they'll very willingly do that. We're even doing that in, in the Chihuahuan Desert without any problem, coming, coming to water in small groups and walk, walking a long way to water, but in small groups. But the key to that is if there's water always there, okay, and the, the group prior didn't drink it down. And again, that's why high flow valves, pipe diameter big enough to get water flow in there and all of that and fill it, then they'll gladly wait. They'll be patient. You don't have a problem with that. Uh, now, other things that we do, we have a lot of lakes and ponds, but we never let them just go drink out of a lake or pond. So there's two different things that we do there. One is we build watering ramps into those, and that's the only place they can access it and drink. We don't build those ramp, we build them 12 foot wide. Don't build them too wide because again, the same principle. You don't want the whole herd trying to go and drink at once. That, that, that's not helpful to you. You want to train them again, a few head at a time. So don't build your ramp too wide. We lay down geotextile fabric, rock over top of that, and ring the rest of the lake or pond with the single strand of poly wire to keep them out. So the only place they can access and drink is down on that rock, down in the water. It keeps them from mucking and mudding up, and they don't defecate and urinate in it and all of that. They, and we want big rock that's a little uncomfortable on their feet. So they walk down, they drink, they do their business, they, they come back up and let the next groups go. Uh, the other thing that we do on our ponds and lakes to get more remote water sources, regular ag totes. You can get those for nothing, guys. I mean, the ag totes are everywhere. They're a dime a dozen. We set ag totes up, put put a, a, a pump on them, solar power pump. So we, we put solar panels there and a float there. And they pull water out of the pond or lake, keep the tote full. And then we have a trigger that pumps to the remote trawls. to a remote trough from the pond and we just use that ag tote as the sore, as the reservoir to be able to store water and then keep the trawls full okay and all those trawls are portable trawls moved around and all of that line is setting on top of the ground and moved around your gravity flowing from the top Where, well in some in most areas we're gravity flowing but in some areas we actually use a push pump Okay, to get it done if we need to. Yes, sir. You know, because of where the cattle are located and them drinking there, we don't have a problem because we work with a tote, you know, multiple times as we're mo moving them through the paddocks in an area, and it we don't have an issue with that. Now, what, but once we're out of that area, then we drain the tote, turn off the pump, drain the tote, and all of that, and we don't refill it as a reservoir until we're getting ready to move back in and graze in that area again to prevent it from getting really hot in that tote. What, were you asking about hot water in the pipe? In any of them. Okay. All right. So way back in uh, late 80s, early 90s, is when we started using over-the-surface black poly pipe. And at that time, there's a lot of concern about the water heating up. All right, a couple things going on. Uh, the size of the pipe is going to determine how many gallons there are per 100 foot of pipeline. And when you do that calculation, uh, you're surprising in a 1,000 foot of pipe, you might be surprised at how little water there actually is in there. You know, maybe 30 gallons. And if, uh, Russ talked about using just a half a barrel. If you And that's what we did our research with was uh, half barrels painted black 
and we looked at 1,500, uh, 1, 2,000, 2,500 foot of line and basically determined it was a non-issue. Uh, the larger your reservoir, you have a dilution factor and it immediately cools. But if you're running 100, 150, 200 head on one of these systems, the turnover of water through the pipe is so quick uh, that it's just a non-factor. And grass growing over the pipe in this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and grass growing yeah. over the pipe. You know, when you first put it out there, it's exposed. If you're properly grazing and leaving residual, that pipeline's going to get covered up pretty quick. Yeah, I can uh, attest to uh, your water cycling through through your tank faster. Your, your, your smaller tank, and you, you don't want to go too small naturally because your livestock need an adequate amount of moisture or water. Um, oftentimes, it could be... 97 degrees on the farm you reach down that tank you're looking at 60 65 degrees so and uh alan had talked about a solar pump i have a solar pump that i'm going to talk about later today that i built um with a hundred year old piston pump that cost me 600 bucks and it's portable it's completely portable i, I can take it to the farm i can take it to my lease property so there's lots of options out there for portable pumps to, for ponds we measured water temperature in those tanks at 8 a.m., noon, 4 p.m., 8 p.m., and 4 p.m. in the afternoon was the only time we really had elevated temperatures. Well, what about freezing, winter freezing through those oh. pipes? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's ways around that. I've done videos on it. Uh, if you go too far, naturally, you're going to freeze. Uh, so that's why we have frost-free hydrants. We usually... In the dormant season or whenever there's snow will graze back to the hydrant but we've been able to put the you go to like home depot or walmart you get that foam insulation for around a pipe oh, yeah. you can put the foam insulation and then i have also developed the valve and i don't know of any other valve out there that has this i put a needle valve on the pressure side of the valve and you turn that needle valve on and it's kind of like if you were in a drafty grew up in a drafty house in the winter time, you leave the water run a little bit so it didn't freeze up. So it's under the same principle. You just crack that open and leave it run. And if it's super cold, normally I just flip the tank out at night. But the I'll, sh I'll be showing it later today. But I have guys in Saskatchewan, Canada using it. And he said he's had it tested at 24 below zero and, and not, not freeze up. And I've been doing it for four years. What I've designed, I've been using it for four years. I've never froze a water hydrant up, and I keep water with the cows all the time. Now, they can eat snow um, and get adequate moisture, but there's a lot of folks up there, if they've seen, I have a neighbor, she'll walk the road, and she'll call me and say, hey, I don't think there's enough water in your tank. So it's a good way to for the Humane Society to come in, you know, and, and naturally they're not going to know that those cows can adequately eat snow and, and do well, or even the sheep. I mean, sheep don't use water at all in the wintertime, especially if there's snow on the ground. Um, I never see sheep tracks to the tank, but for to keep Humane Society away from me, I have to keep uh, liquid state water in the livestock. If you have a spring as a water source and it's ad adequate flow, uh, the point's already been made, continuously flowing water won't freeze. And the way we keep our water system open in Idaho and minus 20 to minus 30 used to be very common. The last several years, not so much. But continuously flowing water, even mi minus 20, minus 30 degrees, is not yeah. going to freeze. Yeah. I was on one farm and they used, and I, Jim, I know you sowed bubblers in the yeah. past, and maybe now too, but uh, the fish water, the fish, you know, on your boat, you got a tank and they put bubblers in there to keep the fish uh, alive and all and fresh. But you can, I saw this guy was using a solar panel and a bubbler in his big water tank and it did never freeze. And so it, that's something I'm thinking about installing in some of my permanent tanks, but it could be used on a portable. Another thing we hadn't covered yet was on a tank, you know, the livestock are going to group around it and all. So I always put some temporary post across it, and it might be a poly wire. It might not even be hot. Usually it's not. 
and and they don't bother it and get in there and mess up the valve so do protect the top of that tank it's worth the trouble because they get in there and step and break your valve or turn it over or whatever Alan. i completely Alan. agree Alan. yes I, I got a question about your, your toad and your pump yes sir are you able to use the same pump to pull the water out of the pond into the toad and then that same pump pushes it to your tank okay so the question is are we using the same pumps to pull it out and push it no, we've got two pumps. If so, where we can, we're gravity flowing, so we only have the pump pulling it out of the pond. But if we if we're going up slope any at all, then we have a second push pump, and they're just solar electric, you know. So and we have the 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 batteries there. We use the deep cell RV batteries. We found those to be the best, and and so we just have a box there. It has the deep cell RV batteries. It, it has, you know, our, our electric pumps, everything right there. So it's all connected and protected and so forth. Yeah. Now, I, I, I agree with Greg on we do always put a poly wire across our water trawls because we do not want them tempted to try to climb in or anything like that. 100% agree. The only area talking about exposed hose or pipe on top of the ground the only area that we have any issues with that is with our chickens uh so we're running you know eight thousand or so laying hens and you know multiple multiple chicken caravans all of that and going from riser to riser so we hook in with hose at each riser and we can have some heating issues there because we we're using smaller hose and we're not going a long distance so what we do there is we put a splitter and we keep a continuous flow so we hook up so the only time we have that problem is in the summer right and so we hook up a sprinkler just a regular sprinkler and the chickens love it okay so it's a way for the chickens to cool off as well and it keeps a continuous flow of water so and we use all nipple line waterers so all of our caravans you know we have the nipple line water is going down with nipples every six inches apart and so we have no issue with heated water by putting the splitter in and running the sprinkler so we have the continuous flow so other other questions or comments about water I, I got burned by water from my poly line, and then, I, but I never once yeah. touched a tank that was not cool. Hmm. I, I've seen the water in the line hot, but it's, it's never been, it's, every time I've ever touched any tank, it's been at least cooler than my, my temperature. It dilutes out. Yeah. The, the only other thing I'll mention is that you know we, we hear a ton about riparian areas and you know fence off your riparian areas don't graze your riparian areas and so forth and you bet we graze our riparian areas okay uh, and there's two strategies that we use so we do fence them albeit it's just typically a single strand of high tensile you know on both sides and we come off of them a little bit uh, and so there's times that we go down and build access directly into them to drink and then it's just for while they're there and then they're moved on to the next point the next point the next point so there's no beating up any area but there are times when what we do to be able to because what will happen in those repairing areas if you don't graze them they're going to grow up thick choke everything else and what amazes me is that Multiple state, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, DNRs, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, conservation organizations, on and on and on. They they want us to fence them out permanently and never allow livestock in there, but then to control all that brush growth, what do they do? They spray it. Are you kidding me? That's better than livestock grazing it, really? So right on the water? I'm going to spray chemicals that are then going to go downstream. I, that that has never made any sense to me, and how they make sense of that, I, I have no clue. But what we'll do, because we have them fenced on both sides, and again, simple fencing, single strand, 
then we can turn them actually into the corridors. So we'll turn them into there, and that becomes a day's paddock, okay? Just going into the corridor. And we have worked with uh, Ducks Unlimited quite a bit and with Trout Unlimited, and we have done a lot of trout fishery restoration by using livestock as our tool to go in and adaptively graze the stream banks, and it has done a really, really good job of restoring these fisheries. In wildlife management, there's two main things, and that's disturbance and recovery, and just like grazing. In Tennessee, we're lucky. We've got a lot of proponents of grazing in Tennessee, and, and they support uh, using grazing. They call it flash grazing. No thing on these corridors, look at your aerial map, and don't forget that these corridors or riparian areas are corridors for you to go across the whole farm. If you've got them fenced off, you could go through there in one day and get back to the corral and start over. So don't overlook them as an avenue. Don't overuse them. Definitely don't want to overuse them. That's what's going to bring the regulations whenever that kind of thing comes in. Flash grazing is, is a term that most of them will understand. Okay, we've got some more weeds somebody brought me. <laughs> uh, let's see. We've got, they, they're bound together here. So I've got dewberry. Uh, this one here, or raspberry, it's got a rounder stem than blackberry. These can uh, take over big areas, and they can smother a lot of grass. Sheep and goats love them. Uh, cattle would nip at them too. Uh, again, the high density grazing would be an avenue. I do, managed farms, I rarely see these be a problem. Now, blackberry in this area can be a big problem. Um, it's it's a biannual, but it comes back to create new canes and all. So, uh, this is the green briar. Handle it delicately. Um, high protein, deer like it. In fact, the wildlifers talk about using it for for deer browse and how valuable it is. Uh, it's kind of the same as that one as far as the mash. Green briar. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad dude when you walk through it. <laughs> you won't walk far. And then I had one more, and it's wild carrot if I can find it. Um, it probably got tangled in the mess. But Queen Anne's lace, yeah. Yeah, good eye. Yeah. Queen Anne's lace, um, it, I don't know. I don't really. It, it's one of those just splattered in the pasture usually, and and it's definitely a pollinator habitat. It's oh. got a great root on it, just like a carrot. It looks like a white carrot down in the root in the ground. You could dig these up and be an indicator of compaction if they took a J or something. Then you've definitely got some compaction. Uh, just look at the roots. You know, like Alan's got a shovel here. We'll do some digging in a minute, but. Um, uh, yeah, if you look at their roots and if they're they're going down and then they go sideways and usually in a pasture situation Commonly, there's some compaction right below two inches or three inches and why is it at that level? Why would it not be right on the surface? All the roots are in the top two to three inches not all the roots a lot of the roots are in the top two to three inches And they've resolved the issue the key to compaction is more roots Mike, you want us to move around a little, or? Yeah, it's like a pasture stand. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm letting you all lead. <laughs> well, well let, let's do this real quick, since we're... When we get down, I, I do want to go just across that ridge right there. Excellent. Okay. So, since we're right here, and, and I want to do this very purposefully, because there was disturbance here, again, installing water, those types of things, and I know that, but... I want to I want to be able to show you something here before we move to a much better area and do some digging. So, uh, remember yesterday I said a shovel is the very best tool you can have, and if you only want to use one tool to make decisions, this is going to be it. We use other tools as well, but but this tells us an awful lot. Uh, since I dig in a lot of different types of soils. I want a nice sturdy shovel. So this is called a root slayer and I own this on purpose. You don't want a wooden handle, you want either a metal handle or a very stout composite handle and a nice sharp stout blade. I'll tell you this, this little story real quick. We were up in South Dakota, west of here, and we 
one of our clients ranches is located there and right beside immediately beside their ranch is North America's largest contiguous certified organic farm okay 35,000 acres of certified organic production now on most certified organic acres how are they operating it very conventionally I call it conventional organic Okay, they're doing tons and tons of tillage and all of that. They actually, there's a lot of, I mean, this is, you know, like I said, west of Pierce, South Dakota. So there's a lot of terrain, topography, slope, all of that. So they have a lot of erosion and runoff on a certified organic farm. So we had a group of about 65 there that day in a workshop. And I uh, they had their shovel that they were letting me use. It was a regular spade, wooden handle, and regular blade and all of that. And I tried to penetrate the certified organic field, and it literally bent, and I've got pictures of it and 65 witnesses, but with one jump on the shovel, it bent this blade almost to 90 degrees. Okay? Then we went no further than from here to across the road into our client's field, and it just went zoop right down. Okay? So we're going to do it here. I know what we're going to find, and it's not going to be what we want, but I want to do it so that you see a contrast. So the first thing I'm going to do, I call it the jump test. Now... I get more and more leery about this. I'm 62 now, and Greg, I, I think if I miss, oh boy, you know. But uh, I want to see, actually, that did better than I thought it was going to do, Mike. Okay? So I want to see how far down is it going to go with the single jump, and I weigh about 200 pounds, so it is going to be relative to your weight, but uh, I only want to make one sheared side if possible. If it's really tough, I'll shear this one and right beside it. But the key is you want to be able to get a good bite, a good cut, as deep as you can go. And there's gravel and stuff in here that's preventing me from going deeper. But um, it's the unsheared side that's important here. Okay, the unsheared side. So this is why you need a stout handle. Okay? In these really tough soils, because to get that, you got to put some pressure on it. And I want to do it as gently as possible. Okay, as gently as possible. We break this open. Okay. So, I want to know, and I'll hold this up. Tell me, so this is the surface up top. Tell me what you see. Clay. Okay, well, clay. Okay, there's some, a little, few roots here. Okay. Compaction. Okay, compaction. What else? A few rocks. A few rocks. Blocky. Blocky. Thank you. No aggregates. And platy. It's blocky and platy. We've got distinct plates in here. In almost every row crop field known to man, you're going to find distinct plated layers. And those plated layers paint a picture of the different types of tillage they have been using and how long they've been doing it. And you can't hide it. You can't hide it. If they've gone in and used moldboard plowing and if they've used high-speed disc, if they've used this and if they've used that, I can tell you that just by this, okay, pulling this up. And I can tell you how long it's been since they've used different types of tillage by the plates and the layer that the plate is located in. So remember the quote I gave you from Loudermilk yesterday? You know, the land does not lie. It tells the story of what men have done to it, right? So we're reading the land here. We're reading it. It can't lie to us. So again, what we see here, and I want you to see this so that you note the contrast when we go to a much better area. But what we see here, first of all, you got a distinct 
crusted layer on the top here. Very distinct. And when you have a surface crust layer, what does that immediately tell you? Water's not going to infiltrate, right? Or not very well. So you're going to have a lot of ponding and pulling and runoff. Here you got slope, you're going to have runoff. Okay? So everything, when you get a rain, when it hits this spot, until this gets covered and gets enough roots in the ground, it's just going to run right downhill. Okay? So a distinct crusted layer. And a lot of row crop fields, with row crops actively growing, and I'm talking about corn, you know, that's that's six foot higher, higher, and soybeans and all of this, and they still got a distinct crust layer. And they're running pivots and running pivots, and they still got a distinct crust layer. They are not infiltrating. They're calculating, you know, how much water they're putting out, but it's not going in. So, you know, and the same thing, an inch of rainfall is not an inch. Okay, if you didn't infiltrate it, you might your rain gauge may show you got an inch of rainfall, but but if this is what it's falling on, you got two tenths of an inch at best. That's what you got in terms of infiltration. Uh, one time, one time I, uh, one time I was running a rainfall simulator, and some people that uh, with John Deere that were doing rainfall monitoring, they had monitors in the ground, and one guy just said. That's it. That's it. That's why my monitor's not working. He had replaced his monitors. He says, just not getting enough water to it. So they just kept trying and trying. And he said, this is it. It was the tillage was keeping the, from getting the water infiltration. No, I didn't come here to talk, but I will. So th this is all brand new knowledge, isn't it? Right here about what Tillich does. In 19, I believe it was 1951, Edward Faulkner published Plowman's Folly. And that's 71 years ago. Everything we're talking about here, it was in the book 71 years ago. Uh, it, so old it's new, right? Uh, it, it's lost knowledge. Lost knowledge. And that's unfortunate because we once had this knowledge. So... Tell me what else you see and don't see. What you don't see is every bit as important as what you do see. You don't see aggregates. Okay, there you go. We don't see the aggregates. And is there are there any aggregates here? No. Okay. There's no aggregates here. I mean, this is like a darn clay brick, right? Okay. Aggregate soil aggregates are the soil particles that have been glued together into much bigger particles by biotic glues that are produced by soil microbes, principally mycorrhizal fungi. They produce a bunch of biotic or biological glues that glue the soil particles together. And, you know, there, there's three basic types of soil, right? And what are they? Sand, silk, clay. clay. Okay, this is what? Okay, which one has the smallest particles? Clay, very, very tiny. That's why you make bricks out of clay, okay, and not sand, because it has the tiniest particles. So you desperately need, whoop, we lost our power. Yep, you desperately need aggregation here. Okay. Yeah, aggregates look like cottage cheese. Yeah, yeah aggregates, I, I call them the cottage cheese of the soil the black cottage cheese of the soil, right? So what the things I don't see here that concern me, no aggregates, period, okay? None. So I've got no pore space for water and oxygen to infiltrate into the soil. So this can, this can go anaerobic really quick on you, okay? And you have lack of nutrient, you don't have water, cycle functioning here you don't have the nutrient cycle functioning here all of that you got a lack of things going on the second thing that concerns me is the color okay if we've got carbon in our soil a lot of carbon what color is it going to be okay so the darker the soil the more carbon we have so we're, we're not seeing much there are we you know, so it's just red, red clay, and that, and that's all we got. And third, we talked about it being so plated and dense. If you 
and, and I'll pass this around. So tell me <laughs> the weight of that in your hand. Okay? So if I have the same amount or volume of soil that's highly aggregated in my hand, that in one, the aggregated soil in the other, I'm going to feel like I'm holding a sponge in a light sponge in this hand with the aggregated soil, whereas that, it, it does feel like you're holding a brick. It's heavy. Okay, so highly aggregated, highly functioning soil should never be heavy. You want low bulk density. Exactly. That's high, high bulk density. We do want low bulk density. The other thing is we smell the aroma of the soil. The aroma teaches us a lot, just like aroma in anything else. Okay? And this has a very distinct, now it's faint, but it's a very distinct metallic aroma. And when soil has either a metallic aroma, it's about like smelling a jar full of copper pennies. Okay? So when it has either a metallic aroma or a slight acidic aroma, what is that telling us from a microbial standpoint? It, it, it's a direct indicator, direct signal, and if I pulled this sample and did a PLFA test, I know within a certain range what that PLFA test is going to tell me. So what, what do I know by looking at this and smelling the aroma, what do I already know before I ever pull the samples and run the PLFA? No well, no, we're no talking smell. about not elements, but about, no okay, no, no, Jim said it, bacteria. yes, high bacteria, okay, so this soil right now is very bacteriocentric, okay, bacterially dominated, and, and I'd be willing to bet on this, okay, that with the PLFA sample pulled here and analyzed here, this is going to be 92 to 95 percent bacterial composition. Okay? 92 to 95 percent bacterial composition. That's not good. Not good at all. Okay? What did I say yesterday we needed relative bacteria to fungi? Okay, as close to a one to one as we can get. And I said the real turning point is where? 30 percent. Boy. Listen yesterday. Man. Alright, so that that's correct. If we start to get this fungal component 30% or higher, this soil doesn't look like this at all then. Okay. How do you achieve it? Okay, that that's a very good question. And that's been the things that Jim talked about yesterday, the things that Greg talked about, the things that Russ talked about, the things that I've talked about. That that's how so implementing the principles, the rules, you know, regenerative practices, adaptive grazing, non-prescriptive methods, okay, to where we're adapting to our conditions and we're making sure that we're using lots of observation, but good animal impact on here, given the proper rest and recovery periods and developing diversity. Diversity of plant species growing in that soil radically alters what you're going to see underneath microbially. Now, why is that? Oh, go ahead. So, so why? why? Why does diversity of plants, so I can plant a monoculture here, but if we have greater diversity, what's going to happen microbially? You have more exudates that's uh, sent out. Okay. It feeds more biology. We've, we've got more different, different types of exudates that recruit more different bi microbial species, right? Right. So, just like diversity, okay, now, this isn't great, but it's progressing. It, it's progressing, it's exactly. So, just having a plant grow, especially a grass, okay? Now, yeah, there's been so much pumped into tap roots. We need to find yes. those roots. To, to heal this, I'm mm. not going to plant brassicas. I'm not going to plant tillage radishes. I'm not going to plant turnips. That's not going to heal this, folks, and that's not going to break all this up in spite of what you're told. 
That does not do that. Fine, fibrous roots that can find all these tiny little seams in, in this highly compacted and plated soil. Okay, that's what's going to work and start to break. And you can see it's already doing it. Yeah. Just yeah. single grass plants can produce more than one to 2,000 miles of roots. Okay, counting root hairs and everything else. So you see this here with grass roots, more fine fibrous roots, is starting to break the plated layers. Right. Find those little seams and work its way through them. We're starting to see a little bit of aggregation occurring here, right? A little bit of pore space, that type of thing. Also, what about color? Our color is starting to change a little bit as well, right? Because Why? Why is the color changing? What is this plant doing to change that color? <laughs> Right, sucking in carbon, putting it down here through the roots, right? So we are seeing a pretty big difference already occurring just by having something growing here. And look, look at what's clinging to the roots. Okay, and cattle on their tails, we call those dingleberries, right? Okay, but so I want dingleberries on my roots. Okay, when I dig up plants, I should darn well see dingleberries on the roots of my plants. That, that tells me I've got some mycorrhizal fungi activity going on here. I've got, you know, that those botic glues starting to glue all of these really, really fine particles, soil particles together to produce larger aggregates. All right, can we go over there? Absolutely. All right, be before we go, uh, Mike, remind us how many days recovery on the downhill side and how many days of recovery on the uphill side? Well, we ended at 33, we started at 55, so you're looking at, you know, 55, uh, 40, something there. So 40 plus days over here and less than 20, or 20 to 30 over here. Yeah, 20, 22 less over here. As we walk away from here, I want you to be thinking, is this ready to graze? Is this ready to graze? And then after we're done with the dirt, we're going to talk about how do you know if something's actually ready to graze. Now, now I'm going to chew that when I fix it and start fixing it. Like, do it like, oh, I know the bell graze. I know what you're going to do. Bell graze, that's what are your eyes to get. Yep, that's how you cover the soil and then we're going to start. And you can bail the people with some. There's, there's Sometimes it happens. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I guess when it gets to. Uh, like the the I said we got a spot here and, and it should be pretty obvious. You know, bale was here. There was some bale grazing right here in this spot. You can see how much more vigorous it's growing. You can even see a color difference. And I can see a species richness difference here as well, right? Okay. Now, there was one comment made as we were walking up here, and Steve made it, and it's absolutely true. We talked about this a lot. Photosynthetic leakage is what we call it. Photosynthetic leakage. How much sunlight is leaked, is wasted, doesn't get collected by a plant leaf. Okay? That's very important. Now, Anybody in here an engineer by training? Anybody? Right behind you here. Okay, all right, there we go. So, this, folks, is the world's best solar panel. Human engineers cannot reproduce this. As much as we want to think we can, we can never do this as well as nature can do it. That's right. So we cannot do this as well as it was created. <laughs> this is a fabulous solar panel. This is a fabulous solar panel. This is a fabulous solar panel. This one's the best one right in this area because we... it's flat and big. Mm -hmm. And it, it also can shade more stuff. <laughs> yeah. So here's the deal. With monocultures, if you go out in a monoculture field any time of day, pretty much any time of the year, you're going to see a lot of sunlight hitting the ground, okay? A lot of wasted sunlight. So I want two things. 
in my diversity. I want story diversity. So I want low growing, intermediate growing, and high growing plants. Do we have that right here? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. So we've got all of that here. Second, I want to see as much variety of leaf architecture, leaf shape, as I can possibly see. Do we have that here? Yes. yes. So how much photosynthetic leakage are we going to have here? Minimal, right? We never capture 100%, but we have minimal. But if we were back over there, how much photosynthetic leakage did we have? 72%. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to add in the point three two. But I, 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 I don't go. You were rounding off. You were yeah, I go for accuracy. Yeah, exactly. I hear you. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, so it's very important to have the stories in the multiplicity of leaf architecture. That is going. If we talk about sequestering carbon, all of the other things that you hear everybody talking about ad nauseum today. It's not monoculture corn and cotton and wheat and soybean fields that are going to do that. They are not going to do that. It is all, and it's not conventionally grazed pastures of low diversity that are going to do that. It is only through regeneratively grazed situations that we're creating that and we're optimizing the capture of carbon and so forth. So, what would we anticipate here relative to our shovel test? Dirt. Okay. Well, there are several. This is gravelly here. Where do we get out of the gravel? I'm just doing this one right here. Okay. I got a question while we're going. So leaf area index is the leaf area index is the ratio of square feet of leaves over square foot of soil, or you can think acres of leaves over an acre of soil. We have this uh, grass and there's clover here. We have this patch, um, and it's going to have a certain LAI leaf area index. We have this big old tree over there, what, 50, 60 feet tall, lots of leaves and that. Where do we have the higher leaf area index? The tree over there or this patch of grass right here? That's a trick question. It's, it, it is the forest over there. But it is surprisingly small difference between a healthy grassland that's four or five foot tall compared to a forest that's 60 foot tall. Um, and one way you can tell that is measuring the photon interception at ground level here. Um, it's every bit as dark under this patch of grass as it is if we're under the trees in there. I count leaves all the time. How many layers of leaves are, that the sunlight's going through? And it's common to be a good management with seven leaves. You can get to 11, maybe a few more, but that's about the limit. Then you're out of sunlight and there's nothing else growing. But I like to hit that, I like to go through. If I drop a pin down through the pasture, I want it to hit about seven or more leaves before I turn in the cattle. When I come out, I'd like to hit at least four probably. The way that I test for the, the leaf is I'll take like a stick or I carry a grazing stick, even a step-in fence post, stick it down to the surface of the soil, then count the amount of leaves it touches the stick post, whatever you're using. Put it in this way, like that, and then stand over top and look at it. Yeah. That's measuring a different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so um, what do you see here? Hold, hold that up and, oh, yeah, that that side so tell tell us what you see guys huge color difference okay big color difference right soil it looks like actual soil okay yeah okay so it's darker colored right in terms of so it's got more carbon do what okay you got a whole lot more roots in here right okay 
Do we see, whoops, do we see some ev evidence of aggregation? Yes. Yes, there, there's some. However, there's still plated layers here, okay, from prior, you know, influences and all of that. So it still has the, the plated layers where you've got some bulk density there and all of that. So, so that's still there, and y'all can see a plate right here. You see how it's just completely intact and pretty dense? Okay. If you smell the aroma, the aroma is much better. You can smell the fungal component in here. It no longer has that metallic or acidic aroma to it. So it, so it is a very, very nice aroma here. Uh, and we can see that the plants and the microbe interface, this interaction between them is starting to, to work. It's starting to do its job. You know, again, if we... You know, we can, we can see some aggregates clinging to the roots, and I can see a little bit of root coating, okay, some sheath coating with soil covering the roots, so we want to see that as well. There we go. That's a really good one. Thank you. That's what you want. That's what we're wanting to find. You should not see bare exposed white roots in really good biologically active soil. You should not see white bare roots. So that's your... Fungal indicator. That that's right. That's a strong fungal indicator. So both the dingleberries, okay, and the the the, the rhizosheath coating, both are very very strong indicators. So we call it the dingleberries and the dreadlocks of the soil. Okay, so we want to see dingleberries and dreadlocks in our soil. That that's now also. Look at how easily, even though we've got some plated layers, it's breaking those up with all the root system. And you see all these fine fibrous roots here? They're, they're the ones that do the job, breaking these plated layers up. But you see how easily this soil you know, just sort of crumbles. You know? And again, a nice aroma. Let's take one more like right well, out in here I, I, I need to play some devil's advocate Greg Brand uh -oh. in 1858 what did this landscape look like it was in trees in 1858 really uh, I think so you think so when, maybe not. When, maybe, when, maybe, when, maybe it all been plowed with mules at that point. You betcha. Yeah. If you look at pictures from the landscape, from the like the Battle of Franklin, the Battle of uh, 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 Stones River or Murfreesboro, you see a much more open landscape, and it's being farmed. All right. So I think 150 years ago, up to you know, I don't know, 1920, 1950, whenever. A whole lot of this land was, there was corn grown on this. There was tobacco grown on this. And over there, we had clay. In 1750, that clay probably had a good loam or silt loam cover on it that um, uh, supported good grass on there. And then it was farmed and washed away. I just checked this soil here. And that is much closer to a silt loam, possibly a silty clay loam, because there has been less erosion here because we're a little less steep slope than there. And so we did not recreate this soil in the seven years' time or whatever Mike has owned this. Um, this was in a better condition before than what that on that slope is. Can we restore this? on that slope there yeah. it's a lifetime work though oh, yeah. it's, it's a lifetime's work but we can fix that kind of damage uh, i just don't want any of you who are new to farming to think that in seven years time you can turn red dirt into gray or black dirt right okay. this is three years by the way. three years okay yeah but this up here where we have so much better cover it was better site to begin with than that side slope. Yeah. And I got the microphone all dirty for everyone now. Well, I've collected a few more plants here. Here's This one's real interesting. This is uh, 
curly dock. Look at the root on it. We talk a lot about radish. This one's just native and it's got a root as long as my arm and it'll get about as big around as my arm if you let it grow. It's a sign of low oxygen, but it's fixing the soil. It is, it's, I'm convinced that it's convinced, it's uh, improving the soil. It'll grow in those compacted areas and low wet areas. Cattle love it. Cattle yep. love it, especially in the and spring. Sheep. In about March, they'll just take it, they'll grub it they'll out. Grab, sheep yeah. love it too. Horses goldenrod like in general, I think long recovery when I see goldenrod. Now I'm talking about a full field of goldenrod. But this one, uh, you know, a splattering of it, it's still here but not so much it's a great pollinator it's not like ragweed as far as being an allergen uh, even though it's got the the name of that uh, another one here yeah in my area a lot of people call this one cow itch vine <laughs> i don't know why they got ever got that name trumpet creeper great for hummingbirds usually you see it only be a problem in hay fields uh, because it, they graze it out here. You see good grazing on it, don't you, Mike? Yeah, that's the same one, the trumpet creeper. And then uh, here's the plantain. You know, this was an upright one. Uh, you, we were, where we were standing a minute ago had a bunch of it. When it goes upright, it's just a forage. I, I wouldn't worry about it at all. And then we got two more here. We got a turnip. This one's the turnip, and you, then you see the radish, and and it has a more variegated, not variegated, uh, inset on the leaf there. You can see the root had a little issue. Gotcha. They don't think you've got compaction just because these start coming out of the ground. They all come out of the ground at the top. Uh, that's not, they're not pushing up that way. That's just the way they grow. But this is the, it did have an issue, hit something there. Oh, he may have stumped me on this one. Anybody know this one? I don't, it's not knotweed. Uh, I, I don't know this one. It's an interesting plant and it's not, not going to cause any issues. I would just look at it as adding to the, the diversity here. This is brown-eyed Susan and it's actually better adapted uh, in the area than black-eyed Susan, more native. If you order seed from Roundstone or something and you're doing a native planting, a lot of time they'll put this in there and it'll last for about a couple of years. Animals typically don't graze it a lot. Mike, you seen any grazing on this one? On no. That, no, no, but, but I don't see it be an issue either. So, uh, you know, you could put a small amount in your you know, seed mix if you were to do something, uh, but I wouldn't go overboard. Coreopsis is another one. I wouldn't plant Coreopsis because they usually don't grow graze it. So be cautious with some of the pollinators. Is that one good for pollinators? It is. Brown. Well, uh, I think he said it was good for bumblebees, I believe. Coreopsis yeah, and he also, is annual, yeah. right? What's that? Coreopsis is an annual. Which I believe it is. Which Coreopsis? Yeah, yeah it was, there's several. Year. There's a yeah. lot of Coreopsis. I find the okay. Plains Coreopsis to be really palatable. Okay. Okay. And then Cockerbur, our old friend. Uh, this is uh, this one will move around on the animal's tail and and all, and it's got a big broad leaf, a lot of light interception. Uh, I pull this one up and put it in the back of the truck and seed the whole farm if I don't get it out of the back of the truck. But uh, but yeah, they'll eat it. Yeah, they'll eat it. That's not a problem, but it's still. Bad. And sheep will really eat it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheep like it quite a bit. And it, but it contaminates wool, and it could get on the sheath of the animal, and they can't breed. Uh, so, yeah. And then crabgrass. Yeah, this is second. This is my second favorite weed or plant. It's crabgrass, and it's the one that that I seed. Uh, if I'm overseeding a pig area or something and can't do anything else, then I just throw out some crabgrass along with other stuff. But uh, it's it's a great seeder and reseeder so it's a great component a lot of times if i'm seeding annuals i'll seed crabgrass the year before i do perennials and then this will continue to fill in voids in the future got a question yes sir on the crabgrass is there any protein value in that oh animal? yeah it's real good protein like, is there a lot of sugar in it there would be just when it's when it's vegetative all of them lose sugars when they get more mature but yeah gotcha. yeah it's good a couple plants that we discussed here, and, and I don't think Greg touched on it, uh, the Queen Anne's Lace, the Kirk
curly dock. Um, I, do you have bull thistles here? We do. Okay. Those three that I know of are actually biannual plants. So if you got bull thistles out there in your pasture and you're going out there and cutting them after they, they went to seed, they're going to be dead next year anyhow, so what's the point? Um, so, and you've got to think, those, those three plants have huge root systems or huge tap roots that go straight down into the ground. Once they die, that creates uh, channels for water infiltration and other plants actually it actually helps other plants access those channels to be able to drive drive their roots a lot deeper as well so i have another question for you i'm sorry um on <coughs> cutting these plants or, or getting rid of these plants what if i'm just mowing them that's not killing them right that's just keeping them to a minimal yeah, level they just knock some back yeah, yeah it's just, just knocks to give them those back. plants that's, not gonna, that's gonna help my soil um keep those root systems down and turn my red clay compacted soil, make it a little bit looser, but still yet not let the weed get out of hand. Well, it depends. If you, if you cut that down, you're opening up that surface for uh, compaction from the rainfall being one of them. I have actually had an engineer figure this out for me. A gallon of water has approximately 42,000 drops in it. You have 27,000 gallons of water to the acre per inch, and that's those raindrops traveling at approximately 20 miles an hour at the surface of the soil is energy equivalent to 2.2 pounds of TNT or dynamite going off on your, you know, the surface, surface of the soil. soil. So you know that's that's a lot of energy. That is a huge amount of energy. So it's very important to, to keep this cover on here. Because that actually, you know, when a raindrop hits that, that actually acts as a shock absorber gotcha. to prevent that compaction. But the other thing that's happening there too, and, and again, the rule of compounding. Remember, I talked about the rule of compounding yesterday. There never are any singular effects. Okay, everything that we do creates a host of compounding, cascading effects. You put the table up yesterday, I believe, about root growth stoppage, right, Russ? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did y'all did y'all pay attention to that table that Russ threw up there yesterday in his presentation? It no. it talked about the amount of leaf volume that you remove from plants and what that creates in root growth stoppage. Okay, so if you get above 50 percent, if you get up to 50 percent leaf volume removal, then you'll have somewhere between two and five percent root growth stoppage. But if you go just 10 more percent, you go from, you jump from 50 to 60. Now you've got 50 to 60 percent root growth stoppage, and you go above that, you got 80 to 100 percent. So if you mow, 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 you've got a lot of root growth stoppage. And what's happening to those roots? They're always staying shallow, and you're never building the root depth, the root mass that you need to break all that up. And you're also are not building the microbial population and supporting it that you need. So. So a lot of mowing is never going to produce for you what you want to do. It, it, it's not going to, to be favorable to recovering that area. So then what if we're bush hogging at eight or 10 inches? <coughs> Again, the, fre the frequency, thing? you're gonna have root growth stoppage. Gotcha. Okay? So the frequency and, and depending on what's there, even at eight inches, if you're opening up Gotcha. That that area and exposing it to sunlight, and it's the summertime. That soil temp is going to be heating up to 130 plus. Right. You're going to have evaporative water loss okay. and all of that. So that's still occurring. Gotcha. And another thing, Greg did he talked about the ironweed and being careful about mowing it. There's a lot of good research out there saying if we clip this multiple times a year it actually encourages it to spread more. That's correct. Oh. So, you know, I, I was on a farm doing a pasture walk, and this guy had ironweed everywhere, and I'm like, what's going on here? He says, yeah, I clip my pastures every time the cattle go out, and it's like, that's why you have so much ironweed. We got a question right here. Somebody right here. Oh, what about the oxygen in your soils deep down? Let the microbial... Well, you you need oxygen deep down. So the deeper, it, ha, have any of you ever seen? That's what I'm 
how deep, and I'm going to show you some stuff this afternoon to show you how deep roots can go, but has anybody ever seen this from, from prairies and all of this, how deep roots and how vigorous those root systems can be? If you look at those pictures, I mean, we're talking about going down 15 feet, 20 feet plus. Wow. Okay. So everywhere you have a root, folks, if you have a root growing in that ground, no matter the depth, you've got oxygen, you've got water, you've got microbes, you've got mineral cycling and water cycling. Okay. So rooting depth That's is critically right important to, and, you know, if we want to oxygenate that <laughs> soil and so forth. So I do want that soil oxygenated absolutely as deep as, as I can grow a root. Like I said, this is a low oxygen plant. And it's going deep. It's fixing that issue. Yep. Gotcha. Well, also, I'd like you to touch on just having the presence of livestock grazing the um, the growth hormones. You know, the hormones of the saliva in that animal transferring to that plant, to the soil. Yeah. Go ahead and. and okay. She she's working with me on this one. Um, <laughs> That's good. Yeah, the saliva of ruminants contains plant growth hormones, and the very act of grazing, uh, you, you, they co-evolved. It's a symbiotic relationship between the ruminant and the plant, and so the animal has taken away the leaves, the photosynthetic capacity of the plant. But it has given back a stimulus hormone to accelerate leaf recovery. So it all works together. Uh, since you don't get that with a mower. Yeah. So and, and one thing real quick before you leave that, Jim, is that so folks, there again, rule of compounding, not only do their saliva contain those plant growth hormones that are vital because it all worked that way for millennia, right? But from the saliva, from their hair coat, the manure and urine, they're shedding billions and billions of microbes. So they're adding biology back to the soil. So for all of those out there today, and they are getting more and more plentiful and numerous in terms of the chorus of we've got to get rid of livestock, we've got to get rid of ruminants, and we, we've got to quit grazing. That, that's exact. if we want to destroy our earth, and if we want to absolutely have famine and everything else, and disease and pestilence, get rid of the grazing, get rid of the livestock, and go to crops only, and that is what we're facing. I'm sorry, I just had to say that before we got off of that. That's good, that's great. Yeah. Hey, does anybody remember uh, yesterday how I first defined overgrazing? Anybody remember? Grazing a plant when it is in a negative carbohydrate balance. So did anybody wonder, what does that even mean? Yeah. All right, so if you think about, um, in a place where you have real winter and plants actually go dormant over the winter, in the spring when they start first start growing, where's the energy for growth coming from? Stored carbohydrates. It's not from active photosynthesis. So it puts up one little leaf. Now that one little leaf is going to start photosynthesizing and helping it out, but it's still drawing on energy. Can I get you to hold those for me, kind of in an array, because I need to get at them. All right, so um, I've got a little uh, Dallas grass there that only has two leaves, I think. That's going to be right here. So when we think about uh, phase one, phase two, phase three growth, it's really about the amount of solar interception. When we think about negative versus positive carbohydrate balance, uh, we have a negative carbohydrate balance anytime the plant is drawing more energy upwards in the plant to support new growth. We have a positive carbohydrate balance when there's more energy flow downwards to build the roots to store carbohydrates. And I've got a little bitty Dallas grass tiller here. Now, it's interesting that it's trying to head. In warm season grasses, heading is driven by accumulated heat days. In cool season grasses, it's photoperiod. But there are only two leaves on this tiller. And we look at uh, it being collared, so that little hinge is formed. That's a fully developed leaf. 
this other one here is actually not quite fully developed. This plant is still in a negative carbohydrate balance. It's drawing reserve energy. And it's, it's very arbitrary, but if you want to know whether your plant is in a negative or positive carbohydrate balance, you count leaves per tiller. If it's less than two, you're in a negative state. If it's more than three, you're in a positive state. And between two and three, you're in that transition. So do we want to graze plants when they're in a negative carbohydrate balance? No, no we do not. We want them to be in a positive carbohydrate balance. So I have an orchard grass tiller here. Now, orchard grass is a cool season grass. We're uh, still in the warm season part of the year. I think Mike or someone said that I think maybe next week we'll be getting into cool season growth again. Well, if you look at this, I mean, it's a, a small and it looks kind of spindly tiller yeah. because orchard grass does not grow vigorously uh, in warm weather typically. But there's actually three and a half fully developed leaves on this one. Mm -hmm. So this, even though it doesn't look real strong, is in a positive carbohydrate balance. Take that with you, please. Now, I've got another orchard grass tiller, and some of the leaves have slipped off of it. So that one came from the side of the field over there, where Mike said there was 22 to 30 days recovery. This orchard grass came from this side of the field where there uh, has been 40 to 50 days recovery. And we have five, he just picked a fresh one. Um, on this one I picked, we had five fully developed leaves. Uh, five is about as much as orchard grass is going to grow. What happens if you try to grow more than that? You see the browning on the tips? Uh -huh. This plant is drawing nitrogen out of these older leaves, translocating it to support the new growth. And so you're actually losing nutritive value out of these leaves right now. On something like orchard grass, five leaves is the maximum that you should really ever be looking for because otherwise it's going downhill. In contrast, we have um, uh, some Johnson grass here, kind of, kind of a small one. But if you count there, one, two, three, four, four and a half leaves. Most warm season grasses, with the exception of Bermuda grass, but most of the rec growing uh, warm season grasses, five is what I consider the minimum of where we want to start grazing. Because this can produce eight, nine, ten leaves. Yeah, there's a really, really good orchard grass there. Uh, fully recovered, one, two, three and a half. All green no browning taking place there that came from right behind us did this come from the higher fertility spot right right here right on the edge of the bale right grazing here. uh nitrogen will keep grasses actively growing for longer maintain the protein content and the green color in there uh but th this pasture here yeah this is absolutely ready to graze they're coming across it um at a good time uh, I was a little surprised to see, you know, orchard grass in here with um, uh, five leaves on it and burning off because usually I wouldn't have expected that much orchard grass to grow in the season. If you get in the regular habit of counting leaves on your tillers to assess what the state of your pasture is, one thing you'll quickly see is how long does it take the plant to grow a new leaf. So over there at we'll say an average of 32 days recovery we had three leaves over here with an average of I'll say 48 days recovery we have five leaves what does that tell us it took eight days for that plant to put out a new leaf we could do the same thing there so guess what if you regularly count leaves you can very, begin to very accurately predict how long a recovery period you need on a particular pasture before you come back to it to try to hit it at a, a really optimum point of the yield quality balance of grazing and knowing that your plants are in good condition ready to uh, graze so um, growing points on okay uh, what you brought up here was growing points. I just happen to have a piece of fescue in my hand. Uh, if you don't know it, you should know that grasses grow from the bottom up. 
they are actually pushing leaves up from the bottom of the plant. They do not grow by extending leaves off the top. So orchard grass, which is a cool season, <clears throat> uh, semi-bunch grass, we can argue whether it's a sod form or a bunch grass, um, this time of year, it's not going to produce a seed head because seed heads in cool season are produced in response to increasing day length. We are in decreasing day length now. So this tiller is not going to head this year. It can continue to push out some uh, new leaves, but that growing point is going to be down at ground level. And so if it gets bitten off at this point, you haven't short circuited the reproductive phase here. And as I said, warm season grasses, uh, they had in response to um, accumulated heat days. So this plant, because we see a node here, a node here, uh, there's one up here, and then we have the seed head coming out. The growing point is elevated here. Had this been grazed off, you know, a week ago at that point there, and one leaf fell off, I let, would have left a couple leaves there, uh, this plant could actually try to produce another seed head in this little bit of warm season that's left because uh, in the plant hormonally, it knows that's the phase it's at. Um, but once it made the nodes, that stem's gonna die. Yeah, that, that stem's gonna die. Any recovery would be from not a new leaf from the base of the plant, but a new tiller from the base of the plant, which is a new grass plant. So I wanted to make sure we covered that one because a real common question is, when is that pasture ready to be grazed again? Now you know how to assess it. Watch for those brown leaves too. If you hadn't counted leaves or hadn't kept up with days or whatever, those brown leaves are blocking your solar panel. Gotcha. Any other questions or comments on that part of it? Yeah, like that. Now, in, in sometimes that uh, is a leaf disease that causes the um, ends to brown off. In Johnson grass, that's fairly common because there's some, uh, uh, basically the same Rust. diseases that, yeah, helminthium, uh, helminthosporium, I think it is. Corn, corn gets the same kind of diseases. Um, in warm seasons, they will translocate nitrogen out of older leaves to younger leaves. Uh, but, but generally you see kind of the whole leaf goes brown pretty quickly, I believe. Whereas in cool seasons, it's, it's much more gradual and it's a real indicator that you uh, let it rest a, a little longer than it needed to. We've got some more plants. Got some more plants. A lot of diversity here. Spiny amaranth. That's the spiny pigweed, some people call it, careless weed. Um, it it's produces like 50,000, 500,000 to a million plant, a seed per plant. So uh, it's bad news, even though it's high quality. Uh, we don't want something spiny like this. They'll, they'll avoid it in general and eat around it. Uh, there's a little spider living on it. Russ pointing out the good side of it. Uh, that's a good thing. We like to see spider webs in the pastures. Um, again, they can consume it, but I don't want to see a lot of this. One. Um, let's go on through this gathering what, here. What does it let's see. In the soil? What's it do to the soil? Well, like, it's got a big trap root. Like what does it indicate in the soil? Too? Oh, some people say it indicates high potassium. Uh, in general, I do think high fertility. Uh, usually it's around hay rings where there's lots of manure. Uh, it also indicates past management's had some bare ground. All right, so black walnut, kind of my favorite tree for civil pasture in my area because the first, last to put on leaves and the first to drop them. And they're high value trees and they can tolerate uh, cattle around them. They're, pretty easy to, to grow even though they're slow growing. Uh, they have juglins in them, which is a toxin, but uh, don't be concerned about it. Looks like morning glory, but it's filled bindweed. All the animals will eat it that I'm aware of. It's not a, not a problem at all. Uh, this one's a real interesting one. It's uh, stick tights, but desmodium or uh, tick clover. See the trifoliate leaf on it? And uh, Real good quail food, the seed is. 
It's a, it's a na native legume. It's deep rooted, tolerates shade. It's one in a civil pasture setting. It uh, probably tolerates shade better than any of the, the legumes. Huh. Lance leaf it? ragweed can turn into a bush, looks like a tumbleweed. Uh, not very palatable. Sheep eat it, but uh, I don't know. I, I rarely see it get out of control. However, it's another one I'm not selecting for. Shade or sun? Sun. Sun. Full sun. And this, Russ, you're, th you're saying this is the first year That's of wild carrot or Queen Anne's lace, mm -hmm. um, and the second year it'll it'll go it'll uh, bolt. All right. We, I have more, but I don't know what we I'm already doing. We already covered it. There was Sarisha Le Lespediza, yeah. and uh, if you don't know Sarisha, it can be good or bad. That's the tick clover there. Uh, that's okay. You just had one little stem of it. You just, Sarisha has got good and bad characteristics. <laughs> oh, the aster. Oh, yeah, that's um, what I thought it was. Okay. The asters, Mike said they consume this real well. After frost, do you yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then I had a goose grass. Yeah, there's yeah. the goose grass right there. Goose grass. I used to think, gosh, that stuff's growing in compacted areas. The animal is kind of tough and stemmy. Animals wouldn't like it. They love it. Huh. It's one of the first things they'll eat. They eat it as well as crabgrass. Note this seed head, kind of a yeah. big prong seed head, and then the crabgrass looks similar. We uh, I had some a minute ago, but uh, it's. Crabgrass is a light, lighter type seed head. All right. Gonna move on, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look at this. Probably walk down there and look at field with wing stem on. Talk about. Let's walk down to the edge of the wing stem. There's a lot of sumac in that other field, and sumac uh, has the most antioxidants of any plant that I know of that's been studied, uh, and it can be grazed out pretty easy. That's the dead motor. Rush, there's a thistle. Oh, yep. Yep. Muscadine, some muscadine yeah, but what do you see on that fish? Right? Butterfly. There's, there's three butterflies on that one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. They're, they're desiccated. The cow pads are desiccated and they, they're just a shell, so they've been consumed. Um, Consumed in about 35 days. Can I ask you a question about manure? I know this is kind of like off the, off the subject. No, thing, no, but, we need to talk about it. <laughs> but doesn't manure take out any oxygen nutrients that's in the soil until it dries out? Um, no, I, I, the, the earthworms and all will be drawn to it, you know, and the dung beetles and all. So as it's drying, I, I'm not familiar with anything desiccating. It's, you want it to desiccate because it breaks, sure. breaks the fly cycle. Um, and you want it to incorporate. So the sooner it breaks down, the better it is. Look at your biology is working. Uh, I don't know you of any... You want to leave it in your field? What? You want to leave that in your Oh, yeah, field? leave it in yeah. the field. Yeah, yeah. Cow manure, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be cautious with cow manure, manure coming from uh, a, a feed source you're not aware of. Like if you're feeding hay, it might have that grazon in it, and it could still be toxic and kill broadleaves. She asked about horse manure. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm a horse farmer. You know, oh, okay. I'm the only, well, maybe yeah. two or three of us are horse farmers. What about it? Well, I, I take mine up because, well, first of all, it's really disgusting and nasty and draws a lot of flies in our animals. So I pick mine up and compost it. Um, but I have always thought that it did until it actually rocks in the ground, consumes every bit of nutrients that's in the soil that's under it. I, I never heard anything like that. Hmm. Um, no, it's it actually composting, you're going to lose nutrients. It's going to break down and lose nutrients. It's going to have less pathogens in it, but you're going to have less nutrients. Um, 
it's you know it's safer to use like in the garden and right. stuff but uh, it's it's not got as much nutritive value gotcha. uh, now one thing you're doing by removing the manure is you're breaking the parrot the the worm cycle yes i am but mm -hmm. if you graze above five inches then you can uh you can uh, also reduce the worm's internal parasites well, yeah <laughs> Good old local this, local. And this is this is black locust. If it was, it's a native, and it, it produces nitrogen. A good fence post. There is a disease in it. A lot of heart uh, uh, breakdown of it now. Uh, uh, so the posts are you, not always good. Uh, this one, you, you know, a lot of homesteaders <laughs> like it because it has so many uses in the woods. So hard and all, and you can build a lot of things with it. But it does have some small thorns on it, you see. And um, the nitrogen, it's stingy with its nitrogen. It doesn't really provide nitrogen for the grasses, but it, it makes it have an uh, ecological advantage. Um, honey locust has a lot of press now, and there's thornless honey locust. I was on a civil pasture forum the other day, and it, I asked the question are they reverting back to thorns and the thornless honey locusts? And, they do. Uh, so uh, you have to be aware of that and control the, the seedlings that come from those. But they, there's a whole effort in honey locusts, like Hershey is a variety that produces tons of pods and, and use it for fodder. Hey, you talked about that one. Uh, no, uh, this is, uh, what, oxide daisy. Yeah. yeah. Oxide daisy. And uh, another indicator of uh, lower fertility. Um, again, rarely see it take over or be an issue. I love it. So, and then there's Daisy Fleabane right here with it. That yeah, also so that's Bradley. Daisy Fleabane. And it can get pretty thick and all. Uh, again, rarely with good management, these two are not an issue. And then the muscadine grape, yeah. uh, great for grazing, but we don't want to, it can shade too much. So we need to come back and if we're looking at just this, we want to, there it is there. Yeah, right. And you can see that it's pretty thick and taking up a lot of light. Mm -hmm. But they do eat it when they come in here. So mm. uh, it, it, it shouldn't be a long-term issue. All right, we'll What's switch gears. I, I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, uh, Greg was talking about the uh, cultivated varieties of silver pasture trees, such as um, the honey locust, the Hershey. There's like four or five different cultivars of those. And uh, there's black locust, like ship mass locust. Those are, they don't produce seed. Those all come from uh, root cuttings. And they're also working with black locusts to make veneers quality trees, 90% of the trees whenever you grow them in your silvo pasture. But if you're collecting seeds off those, you're gonna have to be very careful. A lot like the uh, Hershey honey, honey locusts, a lot of those honey locusts, the Hershey honey locust and some of the other ones, they're grafted trees. Mm. So if you collect the seed off the grafted tree, those seeds go back to whatever that root stock was. Gotcha. Um, so, just be careful, you know, if you're thinking if you're going to go out and pick seed off of a honey locust or a Hershey honey locust, you may take it home and, and it will not even be close to the seed yeah, that you collected. I want to make a comment while we're on trees. I, I've, I've visited a lot of farms and I was on two recently. I pull up and it's a hot day. It's a, over 100 degrees around here. That's super hot. Yeah. And I'm looking for a shade tree. They sure. just cut them all down. This is regenerative minded people now. And they just cut down all the trees around the house because they're afraid I'm falling on the house. There's other ways to do it. I was on one recently and, well, this week, and they were topping trees. There's a correct way to deal with trees. Don't just, don't be radical. Study it and know the correct methods to take care of it. Do not lop like I'm mutilating my arm here. You lop back to a limb. So there's ways to do it. I'm not saying don't do it, but but don't yeah, mutilate. Right. There's also a there rule of thumb. Right behind you. There's also a rule of thumb of if you remove 
too much percentage of the top to kill the tree. Yeah, don't remove over six foot a year as a rule, but you know, sometimes gotcha. we can break that rule. Mm -hmm. so, so, quick question go. dealing with um, when you're doing silbo pasture and you're clearing out the timber area to start to overseed, how do you manage the um, poison ivy and some of that coming in because certain areas trying to get sunlight to it? But what's your suggestion? Yeah, goats love poison ivy, gotcha. so that's the easy one. Yeah. Um, uh, and then hogs are a great way to okay. convert if you're doing a slow conversion. Okay. And then uh, if you're going fast and you've got a forest remulcher, then you're ready to get enough light and you just start growing something else. So okay. there's ways, it's time and money, you yeah. know. So I'm on the slow track with hogs and goats. But. Between that and honeysuckle, because honeysuckle just comes in and I've, I've got huge areas of honeysuckle. Goats I love, love it. I don't yeah. know if yeah. you want to go that route. Oh, yeah, but yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. The, and then <laughs> cattle eat honey so okay. okay. yeah and so it smells so super good it's easy to yeah. so will honeysuckle There's get no rid of the um poison so ivy and the there. sumac and things like that we can have it them. just no overgrows shade. it yeah. hey mark asking about shade how you manage shade and were you worried about shade and did you back graze or how did you do it well i'm i'm concerned about shade um other people are not in that mic and uh but <coughs> in in the evening time we get shade off of these trees on this upper this hand right here so yeah. we'll, we'll get it okay they're talking about shade yeah i'm i'm concerned i don't care what animal it is i'm concerned about shade um but not throughout the whole year i think we we overshade too much uh, just like those animals up there they're in the corral right now they don't need to be up there but they're smart because they got shade it's available to them as a matter of fact, I meant to come out here this morning and close the spring gate so they had to be out in the field. And, uh, but there are certain days, you know, when the humidity and the temperature, you know, gets up to a certain point that, yeah, they've got to have shade. They need to have shade. And on this upper field right here, they've got the trees in the evening time. Um, unfortunately, in the bottom, they don't. But one thing that in the back of my mind that I'm, I think I feel a little more comfortable is because there's so much grass here, we don't get a lot of temperature from the ground, a lot of heat mm -hmm. from the ground. We get a lot of cooling from the ground. It's one thing that, you know, you can go up in that Johnson grass and, you know, take a take a probe and go an inch deep in the ground. It's probably going to be 72 degrees or something, you know, mm -hmm. versus right here, it's going to be probably 90 degrees. Right. So, you know, the height. And so we try to, you know, if we can keep a lot of forage ahead of us during that hot time or try to get it to where we're on the upper side of this field during those worst days. Um, that's how we're handling it right now. There's a heat humidity index and right. basically 80 degrees, 80% 80 humidity, anything above those numbers needs shade. And Noble Foundation has one, there's others out there. That's what I go by. So on right. that locust, some literature tells you that's poisonous to sheep and, and goats. Yeah, um, yeah, don't don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Worry about it. No, they <laughs> they'll tell you everything's yeah. poisonous. So what what are y'all recommending to plant for shade? Is it black locust or honey locust or mimosa? Here or I go with persimmon because he's got them over there. He's got the here. persimmon. Yep. But they're dirty. They just fall everywhere. There's a lot of different ways that you can manage for shade. Um, in my area, we didn't have to have shade at all this year. But in the past, um, if you're working off the farm, nobody's going to be there. there. There's several different methods you can have. Uh, you can have them out in a field, set an alleyway to where they get back to shade. Um, if you don't have shade available in there, in the, in the paddock they're working on. Another great way is the use of a bat latch. Keep them out there. You know when the heat index is going to start climbing and, and they need to go back to shade. Set your bat latch to open the gate to let them go back to shade and then kick them back out whenever they no longer need it. Uh, what my preferred method is because of soil nutrient cycling, the longer they stand in the shade trees, the more they're moving the nutrients out of your field underneath those shade trees. So you want to try and keep them out here as long as we can, but there is periods of time whenever we do need shade. So what I like to do is I like to physically move them. If they need shade today, I'll physically move them into a shady area for the, the period of time that they need to be, and then I'll physically move them back out.
And there's another thing that we need to be cognizant of in terms of livestock comfort in the heat of the summer beyond just shade. So it is the sward that you turn them into. Okay, so for people that are that are overgrazing and they're always turning them into stuff that's, you know, sort of patchy, it's short, all of this, their animals are going to require a lot more water and a lot more shade because they're going to be a lot hotter. If you measure temps from the soil up through the sward, there's a cool zone. So if I'm growing back a nice deep sward before I turn them in, then they're walking into a cool zone, okay? And it is significantly cooler than the ambient temperature up here. Yeah. And they have, they're getting capillary cooling. So they've got blood vessels going all the way through their legs, through their feet, and their hooves, all of that. So it creates like radiator effect, right? It creates mm -hmm. capillary cooling. So if you're turning them into nice, dense swords, and, and you can feel that, you can measure the temp in the cool zone, and you can measure from the ground up to when you start getting really hot, but you can feel it yourselves walking through there, okay? And you're much more comfortable, even on a hot day, walking through that versus walking through a much more open pasture. And so what we have seen our cattle do, and keep in mind, we're down in Alabama and Mississippi, okay? So we get really hot, hot humid yeah. days. I'm talking heat index values between 110 and 120, wow. okay? And we move our cattle in the middle of the afternoon. All right, or through the afternoon, multiple times a day through the afternoons on those high heat index days. And when those swords, what they'll do is they'll go out and graze and then they'll lay down in the sward instead of going and shading up. Right. And what, what's happening here is first of all, they're getting capillary cooling when they're standing and walking through it. But then when they lay down in it, they're putting a lot more of their body surface, their hide surface, into contact with that cool, moist soil, and that's creating even more capillary cooling. So, you know, how, how do we think bison and elk and antelope and so forth, you know, made it on the plains? Did it get hot on the plains? You oh, yeah. bet it did. Yeah, how did they make it without shade? Yeah, it, it's through this, this cool zone effect, you know, that they were in all the time. And I was in, uh, you know, in July, I was in, in southwestern South Dakota. We were on several of our clients' ranches. And one day, the real temp, real temp, was 116 degrees, okay, with 20 to 30 mile an hour winds. And to me, it felt like a blast furnace. Yeah. Even though I'm from Mississippi, but there wasn't any, you know, no humidity, but it, but it still felt like a blast furnace. But the bison were fine. I kept wondering how the bison were going to react and respond to that. You know, nobody nobody was drooling. Nobody had their tongues out. Nobody had their heads down. The bison were just fine, hmm. you know, with that. And it, it, it really, truly wasn't bothering them, even the calves. Breed has a huge effect and that, selectivity for that your That is area. correct. Yeah. So adapted. So too many of us in the livestock industry have breeds and breed types, especially epigenetically, and it's more epigenetic than it is breed because I can select within almost any breed for cattle that are more heat tolerant and cattle that are less heat tolerant. Hmm. But that absolutely plays a huge role. So we are, I mean, you know, we use uh, South Pole Red Angus and Piney Woods Red Angus, That's where we are, different. to be able to have cattle that, that are adapt, more adapted to our heat and humidity they also need to slick off in the summer. If they don't slick off by mid-spring or so, you need to be culling those animals. If you're carrying hairy animals into the into the heat of the year, why in the heck are you keeping them? You know, they're always going to struggle, and their offspring are going to struggle. So those that aren't slicking off by April or so, they, they need to be gone. But that's just another thing before we got off of that that I wanted to mention relative to their tolerance to to the heat and humidity out here we not just shade but we can also help mitigate those issues with the sward presence that we're moving them into i did just a little bit of digging right down there where we've got you know all of this stuff growing uh because we've got a lot of pretty tall stuff growing down there and in a pretty good diversity 
and I just wanted to see what was happening. First and foremost, uh, I noticed that we are starting to get aggregation. You can see it here, but we still had distinct plating, and, and, and it was layered, so we have a top plate, this top plate here, that you see and then this was the secondary plate right up underneath the top plate so it was still there and then this is the third plate right up underneath the second plate so there's still the distinct plating that is there but you know, it is starting to heal itself the other thing that i noted in here uh immediately earthworm castings on the surface oh, that's good. so there are earthworms working Moving here and, and i see the the castings right here and then in the second plate, I noted that there's earthworm burrows. So the earthworms are starting to burrow down and work their way through this. And so not only are the roots helping, but the earthworm presence that's coming in here now is also helping to start break all of this up. Let me, let me say something just about water. Well, one more, one more thing. One more thing about here is from about that H post right there coming out this way, there's a rock ledge, limestone rock, okay? Now, this was row cropped at one time. How do I know that? I wasn't here. But from here on, way down through here, there are dozens of gullies in here. So I can tell you this was row cropped probably in corn and probably with mules at one time, or multiple times, I'm going to say. Well, and... But Mike, earlier it would have been cotton and tobacco, you know, and, and all of that. And, Probably tobacco up here. And Jim is absolutely correct in that, you know, almost all of the eastern portion of the U.S., the Atlantic states have had tillage and all of that for 400 plus years now, okay? You get into this part of the country, which it, in the early part was still considered wilderness, but this has had three pushing 300 years you know, of tillage and, and activity. So when we start to think about that, you know, we, we've had centuries now of agronomic activity disturbing this soil, creating erosion and runoff, just like you said, Mike. And the honest truth is in the, in the eastern portion of the U.S., there's actually very, very little original A horizon left. We are, we are actually farming and grazing B horizon, not A horizon. That, that's all long been in the Atlantic and down in the Gulf and so forth. There was very little regenerative ag in that 300 years <laughs> no, It sure wasn't. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> my, my family settled in uh, New England in the 1600s. And you go up to New England and most of it's covered by trees now, but you go out in those forests and there are stone fences running all through those forests and you say, why did they build stone fences in the woods? They didn't. That was all clear. My branch of the family left uh, New Hampshire in 1850 and headed, you know, west to greener fields. In that case, it was uh, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, uh, that part of the world. And so this historic context you know alan one of the first things he said yesterday on the six principles is know your context and in this part of the country that three two three centuries four centuries in some cases of uh, what was done to the land by our ancestors over those centuries has a lot to do with what we're facing today and the further east you go in the u.s the more pronounced it is. So on that, how long did it take to create the Dust Bowl? 40 years. Yeah. When did the homesteaders go into Oklahoma and Kansas and all of that country and start to plow it up? 1880s and 90s, right? Right. Okay. And, and again, I said this yesterday, but what were they plowing with? Horses. Animals, oxen, yeah. mules, whatever, and pulling yeah. single tree plows, right? Yeah. yeah. So in less than 50 years, this is what you need to understand, folks. This doesn't take long to desertify things. In less than 50 years, we took vibrant prairie and turned it into a dust bowl. 
not even with the machinery and the chemicals and synthetic fertilizers we have today. So every one of those farmers that created the first Dust Bowl, the 1930s Dust Bowl, under today's NOP standards would have been a certified organic farmer. Lovely. Okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. I'm, I'm just enjoying this. No, no rain. Yeah. So it feels good. No rain. Dawn and I are not used I've to both hot, humid. I was ready to, you know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Do we have any more questions? Anybody got questions? All right, here we go. For the weed man. Oh, the weed man. Who's the weed man? I think they're all. I was wondering if you'd seen any uh, poison hemlock around here. I had, uh, no, I haven't seen it. Mike, have you got any poison hemlock? Not on this farm, but in Greenville, yeah. You know, I, had, uh, yeah. <coughs> I had one cow eat it and die. I, I was trying to figure out what the heck it was. Uh, I don't know. I've seen some eat it and not die. Um, it's not as poisonous as I first thought. It came in this area about, what, five years ago? Maybe ten years ago now? Um, yeah, it's it's... It looks like wild carrot or po uh, uh, steroid. Uh, steroid. Yeah, it's about this tall. It's got polka dots on the stem. It's purple stem. Uh, usually grows in repairing areas, and then it'll move to other areas. It comes in through hay and all too. So. What, what about arrowroot here? Do you have that? I don't think so. Arrowroot. I don't know it. Yeah. What What about those little purple uh, berry bushes? That you see, some people call them like poke berries. Oh, is that right? they're probably poisonous, but you don't worry about them. Okay. Um, yeah, and then black nightshade is another one that's poisonous, and it has some literature on it. I don't worry about it, because, but I don't have a lot of it. We made poke salad growing up. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my yeah. grandma did. Yeah. But the berries can be toxic. <laughs> American Beauty Berry, that's a nice shrub. We make uh, Beauty Berry jam out of that one. Uh, yeah, yeah, they have little purple things, and, and uh, horses will eat them. My horses will eat the little purple berries, and the birds will eat the little purple berries. I wouldn't worry about it personally, but I don't know. There's a bunch of berries over on the woods that look good to eat. They're probably poke. No, there's little berries in the plant. Okay. This is kind of minor, but uh, poison ivy, cattle love it. Yeah. And if you first come in the field, look to the left where, actually where the heifers and the bulls are, and the, there's a big patcher. The first thing they go after. First thing. Well, a lot of times you turn in a field, if we turned in over there, they're going to go eat the browse before they even yeah. graze. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of times those trees are more valuable than the grass. Now, Grazing the woods, though, there's nothing to graze. If you graze it and it's just a standard woods, there's no light getting to the ground. You graze it one time, the return of growth is about 30 years. So, so don't count on grazing a woods very often. It needs light to get to grow herbaceous or other plants down low. Uh, question for you. Actually, two questions for you. One for you about the poison ivy. So, of course, you know a lot of people are allergic to poison ivy, and if you get in it and your cows get at it, and then you touch your cows trying to move them or whatever, will the poison ivy transfer to you? Yes, yes it would. Yeah, okay, would. so it is. So it, it's still poisonous to you, even though they like it. But they're resistant to oil. Okay. There you go. Okay, okay. You can deal with it, it'll go away. <laughs> yeah, eventually, I, I got it. But I forgot where I was going with the same Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Lead them. Lead them. I'm not saying they're going to leave, but you're better up here. You're <laughs> So today we're here at the Plastic Innovation site uh, where all of these PVC posts are, are produced. So that's some of the background noise that you're going to hear. We apologize for that. Mike McElroy here with the USA Regenerative Agriculture Alliance. And I want to do a little recap on our pasture walk that we had at the 2022 summit. Um, actually, that pasture walk was six weeks ago uh, tomorrow. And, you know, it was a beautiful day. Uh, we had great attendance, uh, two bus loads of, of attendees that attended the summit. 
and during the pasture walk it was it was a great experience for all of the attendees um, some of the things I'd like to highlight were um, the, the, the biggest I guess the biggest topic would be the pasture management system and we talk about systems we're talking about diversity in the forages and one of the neat topics that was discussed were all the different types of grasses both both um, the warm season the cool seasons legumes and forbs that were on and out in the pasture field where we took this pasture walk so as you've seen in the video um, we had these four presenters great instructors uh, talking about pasture grazing management um, today I'm six weeks later than when we had the pasture walk and uh, you know when we're talking about pasture management grazing systems we're talking about diversity of the forages and that's one of the things that uh, I think was a very interesting topic that all of these presenters uh, had had something to say um, great brand first of all uh, was able to pick go around and select about 35 to 40 different uh, forages uh, including the warm season cool season grasses legumes and forbs and um, all of that was discussed between all the presenters uh, talked about their benefits and uh, talk about some of the indicators that each of them uh, might present so dr. Alan Williams uh, did a great job doing the shovel test um, this is really important for landowners. I don't know of, of many that, that may do this or know about this, but it's good to take a spade and go out in the field and look at your soils and see what they look like. And some of the structure that we were looking for um, would be something that looks like cottage cheese. Um, that's, that's where the aggregates are glued together and we get a lot of air and, and uh, moisture and uh, organic matter in the soil. But we also saw some areas that we had plates so we had some compaction and you can actually just peel the soil back in the plates and stuff. Um, different colors of the soils and one of the big ones that you'll be surprised about will be the smell. Um, some of our, you know, your better soils are going to have a real sweet smell to them. Whereas your poor soils are going to have uh, a real distasteful kind of a smell. So that was very interesting to the group. As you see in the video as well, Russ Wilson was one of our presenters. Um, did, did a great job on talking about grazing management systems and diversity of forages and uh, he did talk some about some of the indicators and the advantages to especially some of your deep well rooted um, um, forages that mine the nutrients deep in the soil bring them up to the surface and make them available to um, other plants so that when the animals graze those plants, then they're getting the benefits of all of these nutrients in the soil. Um, and we can see that with the mineral sled that we have out in the field. There are specific minerals that the animals just absolutely um, um, utilize a lot more than other types of minerals. So we have a, a mineral sled that it's a, uh, it's, there's 19 different um, uh, nutrients, micronutrients and macronutrients in it and it's just uh, they they do a selection of whatever their body says they need and uh, it's it's a pretty neat indicator as to what is lacking out uh, in the uh, in the soil so the next speaker uh, Jim Garish from Idaho uh, has 35 plus years experience in, in grazing management systems uh, has written several books one that is really interesting to read is uh, kick the hay habit and he talks about uh, minimizing um, hay as far as feeding during the winter time, getting as, m uh, as much grazing as you can because we know that, that grazing is a lot cheaper than it is feeding hay and, and hay is very expensive uh, to, to harvest and produce. So uh, Greg was, I mean, uh, Jim was, was great in, in backing up and, and discussing all the forages and their benefits and uh, we just had a, a great group of presenters this year and in next year you know we're looking for uh, uh, the same thing we'll have another great group of presenters and we're working on that now 
stay updated for our 2023 workshops and summit, you can go to our website at usaregenalliance.org or visit our Instagram, Facebook page, and we will keep that updated and, and let you know of the dates uh, for those events. And we'll see you next year at the 2023 Summit in Greenville, Tennessee. Um, this is probably going to be the field that we'll have the pasture walk on next year. Um, we're kind of in phase one right now of cleaning out some fence rows, and we're going to begin um, um, installing some new fencing. And it's a field that um, has just um, left alone this year, let it grow, uh, get some organic matter back in the ground, and maybe we'll have some different things to look at next year. Uh, there are some different soil types on here, which is going to be interesting. There is some shale, which we did not have on the other farm last year.